Good morning and welcome everybody to the world webinar of ophthalmology revisions 2021. It's been uh, uh, it's a wonderful Sunday morning for India and for a lot of faculty it's a late night uh, and uh, I welcome all of you. So just to put in a perspective this is a, a, a revision uh, webinar wherein we are trying to revise 360 ophthalmology in 24 hours. So there are seven sessions and this is the fifth of that. And I would like to introduce our uh, chair. Dr. Namrata Sharma is the chairman of this particular meeting. She's professor of ophthalmology at uh, All India Institute uh, of Medical Sciences, RP Center. She's uh, heading the cornea and refractive surgery. And uh, she has, uh, she does not require any introduction to the Indian audience. We get one email from Madam every day, every single day. And there are days in which we will get two or three mails. She's a very dynamic, vibrant uh, secretary of the All, in, uh, All India Ophthalmological Society. Uh, and uh, uh, she has to her credit more than 500 publications, multiple numerous uh, textbook chapters, and uh, 119 book chapters, authored 17 books. She's a principal investigator in a lot of uh, trials and she will be our chairperson. And uh, we have Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan, who is a professor of ophthalmology and consultant cornea and uh, refractive surgery at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She, he did his uh, MBBS from Calicut and MS from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Bangalore and fellowship in uh, cornea from Elvi Prasad Hyderabad. And his areas of interest are corneal infections, anterior segment imaging. And uh, he did a microvascular submandibular gland transfer uh, in the country for severe dry eye. And uh, uh, he has been one of the first and pioneer in the state to perform the big bubble dial DASIC and uh, DASIC. He has nine publications and six international publications. Dr. Vinay uh, Pillai is our other moderator. He is a Chodi and senior consultant cornea and refractive surgery at Giridhar Eye Hospital, uh, Cochin. He was in Shankar Netralia from 2004 to 2009, associate consultant at LV Prasad also from 2010 to 11. And he was in Chaitanya Eye Hospital, Trivandrum uh, from 2011 to 2014. His special interest is in ocular surface disorders. So between the three of them, they will be moderating this wonderful session where uh, we will see the whole of cornea and travel before us. Over to you, Namrata ma'am, and uh, Anil and Vinay. Thank you, Gopal. Thank you for conducting this uh, yet uh, this year again. You did a great job last year. And uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of this. I would now request uh, Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan and Dr. Vinay Pillay to please call the speakers. Yeah, uh, morning everyone. Is it visible? Gopal, is it visible? Uh, uh, you have the presentation, right, yeah. Anil? Uh, yeah, I have the presentation. I'm just trying to. Yeah. Yeah. You come. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the other presentation was gone at that time. So welcome all, a uh, nice morning and a late evening in US, the people in the US. Welcome all to this uh, session on uh, World Webinar of Ophthalmology Edition. Uh, before I say a word, I think I should uh, uh, really congratulate Dr. Gopal for single-handedly uh, doing all the stuff behind this. He has become a pro uh, uh, webinar person in the last uh, one, one and a half years. And with the able support of our residents, uh, uh, he has put out a great show. The, our chairman, Dr. Namrita, has uh, really chalked out a great program uh, with international faculty, uh, Dr. Benny Yang, uh, who's the first speaker now. Uh, he's the professor and chair at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. His special interests are in ocular surface diseases, eye banking, and keratoplasty. He has a lot of, uh, has received a lot of awards, American Academy Achievement Award, author of over 
120 peer reviewed scientific publications, has made more than 500 scientific presentations, and is the president elect of the Cornea Society. He's also the president of Eye and uh, Contact Lens Association uh, and uh, editor of ophthalmology, sorry, associate editor of ophthalmology, editor in chief of Eye and Contact Lens, and senior editor in Cornea. We welcome you wholeheartedly for this uh, meeting, sir. And uh, may I uh, request you to share your slide and get on with the program. Thank you, Professor Radhakrishnan, and thank you to the other moderators, uh, Professor Sharma, for inviting me. Um, I will share my screen now. And um, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very, very happy to be able to talk about a, a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, in neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, and I'll start by saying I have no relevant financial interests uh, in the talk here today. So I'd like to start off uh, talking about this with uh, a, a case example. And this is one of my favorite patients of all time. This was a then 60 year old gentleman who had diabetes. He had undergone complicated cataract surgery, uh, required a pars plantar vitrectomy and lensectomy in his left eye, developed a non-healing uh, persistent epithelial defect back in August of 2015, and was then sent to me for management of uh, this epithelial defect. Um, we did all the standard uh, modalities of treatment, including withdrawing the medications, preservative-free artificial tears, bandaged soft contact lens, amniotic membrane, autologous serum, and we couldn't get it to heal. And four months later, he ended up developing infectious keratitis with mycobacteria and carina bacteria. We couldn't get a control of it because it spread, and he ended up needing a, a penetrating keratoplasty four months later uh, because of non-responsiveness. And over the next two years, we battled with non-healing epithelial defects in this graft. And you can see all the different uh, modalities of treatment that we tried. And this entire time, uh, his other eye was 2020. And so just keep that in mind because we're going to come back to him. But ultimately, this is what his left eye ended up looking at. We finally got it to quiet down, but it's obviously uh, partially keratinized and scarred. And you're probably wondering why I'm giving this talk because I obviously didn't uh, have a very good outcome. But as you know, this is a very, very challenging condition. I use this so that people remember how difficult uh, this condition can be and how, how we had to be very aggressive about it. So what is neurotrophic keratopathy? So Harman de Dua has probably the best definition of this. And you know, I wanted to read it out loud to you. It's neurotrophic keratopathy is a disease related to alterations in corneal nerves leading to impairment in sensory and trophic function with consequent breakdown of the corneal epithelium affecting the health and integrity of the tear film, epithelium and stroma. So what does this mean? So clinically, this implies that neurotrophic keratopathy is likely the diagnosis um, in the presence of an epithelial defect that does not heal or heals and then breaks down repeatedly in the presence of reduced or altered corneal trophic function, okay? There are a lot of other terms that are used. Um, probably the most commonly uh, used one is neurotrophic keratitis um, and they're used interchangeably. You know, technically keratitis implies that there's inflammation and sometimes there is, but I think keratopathy is more of an all encompassing uh, uh, word for it. So I prefer neurotrophic keratopathy. All these other terms here are anatomical descriptions, but don't really um, underscore what mechanism is actually going on with this disease process. Uh, just a reminder of where uh, the problem occurs. If you go all the way back to medical school, you remember that the cornea is the most densely innervated uh, part of the body with uh, 7,000 nerve endings per square millimeter. And it's innervated by the ophthalmic division of the cranial nerve uh, five, the trigeminal nerve. So there are a lot of things understanding that that can actually cause nerve damage, but I'm gonna just focus on the most common causes that we'll see. Um, that include herpetic infection, cranial neurosurgery that involves you know, the, the, the uh, fifth uh, nerve, chemical or thermal burns, and then the one that people forget sometimes is diabetes. Uh, and sometimes diabetics do very, very well until an insult happens like ophthalmic surgery as in my patient I showed you earlier. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, first of all, asking about those risk factors, trauma, facial tumors, and herpetic infection and diabetes, and then asking about symptoms. Oftentimes patients are diagnosed previously with dry eyes um, because they say that they're dry. 
Um, and of course, as the uh, definition kind of implies, as the disease gets worse, they actually start to feel better because they lose the sensation. But ancillary testing involving corneal sensation is the hallmark of, of uh, making this diagnosis. If you have confocal microscopy, you can do imaging, but really it's the corneal sensation, obviously by definition. And then we'll go through the clinical appearance of what it looks like in a moment. If you do have confocal, you see here that in frame A, this is what a normal subbasal nerve plexus should look like. B is stage one, C is stage two, and D is stage three, neurotrophic keratopathy. You see there's loss of nerves as you get worse and worse. So what does it look like clinically? Well, neurotrophic keratopathy starts with um, lack of sensation, which drives tear production. And so the tear production being decreased results in um, increased mu mucus viscosity, and then you start to get um, epithelial breakdown. You get the punctate corneal epithelial fluorescein staining um, that you can see here it's classically in the central part, uh, classically quite coarse like this, it can appear. In stage two, that's when the epithelium actually fully breaks down, and then you get an epithelial defect that's usually oval and in the center or the superior cornea. The defect is oftentimes surrounded by a rim of loose epithelium, and the edges may actually become smooth and rolled. With a chronic epithelial defect, you can get stromal swelling with decimase folds, and you can even have associated anterior chamber inflammation. And as the disease progresses into stage three with the exposed uh, Bowman's layer, then you get stromal lysis and melting when you start having the MMP9s being activated. And this can actually result in perforation. All right, so how do we manage this? Well, stage one management, um, I think is pretty straightforward. You're discontinuing all topical medications, especially those with preservatives, um, treating the concurrent ocular surface problems uh, with preservative-free artificial tears. If there's inflammation present, then anti-inflammatory therapy. If you get that quieted down, punctal occlusion can sometimes help to um, retain uh, tears. And then if there's any anatomical lid abnormalities, those obviously need to be corrected. In stage two, with an epithelial defect, uh, you would consider doing prophylactic topical preservative-free antibiotics. Um, if you're worried about possible melting, then prevention of melting with uh, sodium citrate or the tetracyclines or macrolide antibiotics can be useful. Uh, debriding the edges to help it heal better. Non-surgical eyelid closure, such as tape tarsorophy or surgical uh, temporary or permanent tarsorophy can be used. Conjunctival flaps are used sometimes. I pr prefer not to in an eye that has visual potential. And then there's a whole other uh, host of newer options that I have listed here that I'm gonna take a little bit of time just to go through. Autologa serum, as many of you know, is one of my favorite topics um, in terms of treating the ocular surface. Neurotrophic keratopathy is actually one of the entities that can be treated with it. And the idea is that um, in autologa serum, there is actually nerve growth factor, which we know in some cases can help treat neurotrophic keratopathy. The mean concentration of uh, nerve growth factor in tears in this study was found to be 54 picograms per mil. Just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that in a second. This is an example of a patient who had uh, diabetic vitrectomy surgery that had epithelium scraped and then wouldn't heal afterwards and was sent to me um, after two weeks of non-healing. And I was able to get this patient healed within two to three weeks using autologous serum, not before uh, some subepithelial haze formed, but was able to get the patient healed. Scleral lens therapy is another very reasonable option for neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, these are large diameter rigid gas permeable lenses that are ideally used for ocular surface disease. They range in size from 13 millimeters all the way up to 24 millimeters in the uh, custom manufactured PROSE treatment, which is the prosthetic replacement of the ocular surface ecosystem. But there are lots of commercially available uh, lenses that can be used as well that go up to 17 and a half millimeters. So this is the difference between a standard RGP in the top frame. You can see a small diameter. There's a very little bit of vault and the uh, lens actually sits on the cornea as opposed to a scleral lens where there's a much bigger vault. Here's about 350 microns, um, which is a little bit big, but um, it bays the ocular surface in uh, fluid to help it heal and to help keep it uh, uh, healthy. This is a photo I borrowed from Debbie Jacobs. You can see here the fluorescein green here is that reservoir of fluid that's bathing the ocular surface. And this was a non-healing epithelial defect from neurotrophic keratopathy that was sent to me, had been in bandaged contact lenses, amniotic membrane, um, autologous serum, it wouldn't heal. I actually had the patient uh, uh, put in a scleral lens and slept with it with prophylactic antibiotics, and in six days was able to get the epithelial defect to close. 
Amniac membrane is another method uh, that can be used for this. Um, amniac membrane, as we all know, comes in various different forms, cryopreserved, comes in freeze-dried, and also comes in self-retaining devices. Uh, the trade name is Procara here in the US. Um, it could be put on different ways. Um, I like to take the patient to surgery for this. Um, I put the amniac membrane on the ocular surface um, and then sew it in place with the purse string at the limbus and then put a contact lens and then do a temporary tarsography at the same time. But of course, in the bottom frames, you can see a self-retaining device can be easily put in in the office. Uh, newer is the uh, recombinant nerve growth factor um, that has uh, hit the market in the last few years. Um, and this is a paper describing the multi-center randomized vehicle control pivotal trial um, for uh, Senegermin, which is commercially known as Oxervate. I have no financial interest. Um, in this study, it uh, reflects what was shown in the phase uh, two studies um, that was also published in ophthalmology. Um, with the uh, drug uh, at eight weeks compared to vehicle, you can see here statistically significant better uh, uh, decrease in the epithelial defect size down to less than uh, half a millimeter and also to zero millimeters, about 65% compared to 20% uh, healing um, in the top box. And you can see in the bottom frames, um, the maximum diameter of the epithelial defects uh, decreased significantly with the drug compared to vehicle, demonstrating that it does in some patients have very, very good effect. The one that I really wanna uh, talk about for a second is corneal neurotization. And this is something that is uh, quite new. Um, it was first described about a dozen years ago. And when I first read about this in the plastic literature, I said, this is crazy. Who's gonna do this? And, and how is this even gonna work? Um, and the concept of this was to take the superior trochlear and superior orbital nerves dissected from the forehead of the contralateral side, bringing them under the bridge of the nose into the upper fornix, and then wrapping the nerve endings around the cornea at the limbus to help re the cornea. I said, this is crazy. I don't know how this is gonna happen, but this is you know, their description of it, pulling the nerves uh, under the bridge of the nose and then passing them onto the ocular surface here. Um, it has actually become very, very popular and there's a lot of different ways of doing this now. That was the uh, direct route of um, bringing the nerves around. And in here, you can see on the right side, instead of dissecting out the superior orbital and superior trochlear nerves, you can actually use a conduit such as the, uh, the greater auricular nerve or the sural nerve. You can harvest it from somewhere else in the body and then use that to pass under the bridge of the nose and onto the ocular surface. You can actually, they have um, uh, cadaveric nerves now that you can actually buy commercially and those actually work as a conduit as well. In addition, you can also not go to the contralateral side and you could just dissect it on the ipsilateral side as in this particular case, and just bring down the nerves from this, the forehead down onto the ocular surface like this um, and to re the eye. You can see here um, uh, the left frames um, are uh, before the surgery and then the right frames you can see here um, more innervation after doing the, uh, the corneal neurotization procedure. Stage three management, um, as, you know, as you would for any melting cornea, multi-layer amniotic membrane with a tarsorophy, corneal grafts, tectonic or lamellar or full thickness if needed. And if the eye actually perforates, we know how to manage the perforation, cyanoracular glue in a contact lens, fibrin glue or amniotic membrane, uh, plus or minus a corneal patch graft. So for a multi-layer amniotic membrane, um, I like to do it this way by filling in the, the defect, putting a small membrane over top to, uh, to sew it down, and then a big membrane at the limbus uh, for deep ulceration like this. This was a patient that was in stage three NK, was sent to me. Um, he actually refused to have any sort of keratoplasty surgery, but I was able to get them healed by just doing a tarsorophy. And this is another patient um, that I did a tarsorophy on to also heal it. Don't have to go to surgery. Uh, sometimes uh, they can actually heal if you close the eye. It all depends on the circumstance, but you need to keep these things in mind. Um, in the pipeline, there's a lot of drugs that are uh, being investigated right now. Um, we are part of a study for the uh, Recordati rare diseases, um, looking at a mimetic of uh, nerve growth factor. Um, and so hopefully we'll get some new results with that as well. So back to my patient, remember I said that uh, his, his left eye was doing poorly, his right eye was 20-20. Well, apparently in May of 2019, with that good eye that was 20-20, 
he sat on decreased vision for two weeks and didn't come in. And then was finally came in, was found to have a MAC ARF regmatogenous retinal detachment, underwent um, pars plantar vitrectomy, scleral buckling, and other uh, retinal surgery. And then you guessed it, he developed a persistent epithelial defect, another inciting agent. He underwent a clinical trial to get this defect to heal, wouldn't heal, underwent a permanent lateral tarsorophy and recombinant nerve growth factor. This is what he looked like before we started the recombinant nerve growth factor. After eight weeks, significant improvement. But as we've heard before, they can open up again. And it opened up again here. And so we ended up actually doing corneal neurotization on him nine months ago. And I just saw him this week and he's starting to have corneal sensation. So I'm hoping that he's going to uh, do well with this. So in conclusion, neurotrophic keratopathy is a challenging condition as I've shown you. It can have serious consequences. Standard therapies can be effective and that may be all you need if you can get on top of it. But the, there are a lot of other therapies that are out there and they have evolved significantly over the last couple of decades, including recombinant new, uh, nerve growth factor and other compounds that may be coming around. And finally, don't forget corneal neurotization is an exciting surgical option that cornea specialists can share with their plastics colleagues to help these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Benny, for that uh, fantastic overview of neurotrophic keratopathy. So I have one question for you, Benny, because I think Anil uh, will take the questions uh, right now only so that uh, Dr. Benny can be and then be. Uh, what do you think is the role of uh, Cine Germin? I mean, what do you think? I mean, is it useful for all types of neurotrophic keratopathy or just for the early stage one, stage two? Where does it fit in? Because we don't have it in India. And there are some uh, generic companies or in Indian companies who are wanting to, you know, uh, reproduce that molecule. So where do you think uh, does that fit in? Because will it, uh, I'm sure it will not substitute the tarsorapy or the amniotic membrane, et cetera. So if you could just tell us about that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a controversial topic. Um, in the US, when it first came out, the, it was 80,000 US dollars for an eight week course um, was the market price. Now, the company was you know, very generous in allowing a lot of patients to have it for much less and insurance would cover it. Um, but honestly, um, we have lots of reports of it not working. And I think it works in certain circumstances that are earlier. Um, where uh, the nerves are not disrupted centrally. So if someone's had uh, neurosurgery and the nerve is transected you know, further back, I don't think that this is gonna help regenerate the nerves. Um, I think that if it's early on and uh, like herpetic disease and it's, it, you have a chance of regenerating the nerves, in those cases, I think that it might work. It doesn't work in everybody though. Anil, uh, Vinay, or anybody would want to ask anything? I have a question now, uh, Dr. Vinay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, what are the indications uh, for the amniotic membrane drafting in such cases? Because uh, I've had few cases in which I've done amniotic, but it didn't work much. Probably it was a very short period of relief, but again, things come back to the same. Uh, so uh, what are the indications where you use amniotic membrane in this Yes, I usually use amniotic membrane early on in stage two as, a, as an option. It's one of the many options we talk about. Um, but, you know, if, if it's been a long time that, you know, there's a defect that's present, the membrane, as you know, it dissolves pretty quickly. And so the effect is very short. Even if you get it healed, it does often break down. I try to get it, uh, use that one on the early part of stage two. Um, and then we move on to other things. Of course, amniotic membrane can be useful for stage three if it's melting and you can plug the, plug the defect with that. Um, it can sometimes be very useful as well. Okay, thank you. So, anybody else or uh, Anil, are there any questions or should we move? No, you're muted, Anil. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll move on, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Benny. Thanks a ton. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing Thank this. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. And good night, Benny. Good night, Benny. Yeah. <laughs>
ma'am, can you introduce uh, uh, Dr. Vishal? Because oh, I, I can introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. That's a typical Vishal. <laughs> yeah. We'll save time. <laughs> no, we have enough time, Vishal. We will want don't to introduce. Worry, don't worry. It's a complete <laughs> pleasure to introduce Dr. Vishal Janji. Though you've written so much here, but I know him uh, since he came into ophthalmology on day one in RP Center. And the bright spark was there even at that time. That that smart spike, if Gopal will agree with me, was there even at that time, which you know we could make out. He uh, did his completed his ophthalmology training from RP Center, uh, Ames, New Delhi, and then he completed specialist training in cornea, external eye disease, and refractive surgery in Melbourne, Australia, as well. Uh, he has uh, then further he went on to uh, the. Uh, to Hong Kong, where he was uh, there in Chinese uh, university, uh, Chinese university, Chinese and Hong Kong university, and uh, he was a consultant there. I think uh, the highlight is that he's uh, he has numerous publications in peer-reviewed international journals, and I think that is something which started on day one as a postgraduate student only. And uh, he is a part of a lot of. Uh, uh, committees, uh, which, you know, uh, for instance, American Academy of Ophthalmology, then ARVO, and he's visiting professor at the Joint International Eye Center of uh, Shantou University, China, and Wenzhou Medical School, China. Uh, I think this number is much more than this. He's published uh, more than 250, or 250 international peer-reviewed journals authored uh, two books and written several chapters. Uh, and so over to you, Vishal, and thank you so much for uh, doing this today. Again, uh, I know it's midnight there. But, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, of all the work that I've done, about 50% is with the, either Dr. Northa or Dr. Vashtar. <laughs> you are being modest now. You, you are being modest. <laughs> okay, how do can I? Sh I'm gonna share yeah. my screen. Can everyone else mute, please? There's some background noise. All right, can I start? Yeah. Okay, so I'll spend, this is a big topic, but I'll, I'll try and cover the relevant stuff. And I'm presuming this is mainly for teaching of the residents and, and you know, postgraduate or fellows as well, the first year fellows. Uh, might be talking about diagnosis and management of corneal perforations. I do not have any financial disclosures relevant to, to this topic. Um, when we talk about causes of perforation, we talk mainly about three causes, trauma, infection, and uh, that related to immunological diseases. And it really depends where you work. Um, when, when I was in India, you know, most perforations were due to trauma and infection. Uh, moving to Hong Kong, they became more immunological. And here uh, in the United States, I would say infection still tops uh, other causes, unfortunately. Um, this is not a complete list, but you know what I have seen or what we continue to see uh, over the past 10, 15 years. Infections are always on the top, bacterial, viral, fungal infections. Again, um, if you are in North India, you think about bacteria, you move down south, um, you know, you think more about fungus until proven otherwise. Uh, things are not different in other parts of the world. Uh, we hardly used to see any fungal infections in Hong Kong, but we, you, people see a lot of fungal infections in, in Florida. Um, Australia was all about viral infections. Uh, you know, HSV was, was all over the place. Inflammatory causes, uh, collagen vascular diseases, SLE, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, they're, they're very commonly seen. Um, eye involvement is very commonly seen in these patients. Traumatic causes, chemical injuries and thermal and physical injuries, we still continue to see those more in the developing world or low-income countries. Um, there are patients who will have dry eye and exposure, mainly due to trauma and neurological causes. Neurotrophic keratitis, Dr. Jeng covered that very nicely. Uh, we still see most causes as post-viral. 
zoster of thermicus is one of the most uh, uh, underreported causes of neurotrophic keratitis. And post-surgical, um, when retina surgeries are in diabetics, especially they're one of the ma major causes of uh, neurotrophism, uh, neurotrophic keratopathy, and resulting in corneal thinning and perforation. You can see uh, corneal perforation in degenerative diseases of the cornea, such as teratians and pellucid as well. Um, you don't see much of uh, perforation in keratoconus unless the keratoconus is, is a mixed picture of PMD and keratoglobus. And of course, you know, almost any intraocular and ocular sur surface procedure can result in neurotrophic keratopathy and resulting coronal perforation. As I said, we, we will try and focus mainly on infectious causes. In, for the bacterial uh, infections, you see more, in, as I mentioned, in low-income countries, Pseudomonas and staph are, are the number one causes, one and two respectively. Pseudomonas, uh, the resistance against pseudomonas, separate topic, but I, I want to mention that uh, there is a trend uh, that we are witnessing now. There, there's pan resistant pseudomonas seen all over the world. Um, fungal infections, again, uh, more commonly seen in, in low income countries. Um, Fusarium aspergillus candida, uh, any one of these can be can be seen again depending on the geographical location. Herpetic eye disease uh, typically reported, I wouldn't say seen, reported more from the developing developed world. Uh, this might be related to the to the availability of resources, especially viral PCR. I remember being in 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 India. We we hardly used to think about herpetic eye disease, uh, but when I moved to Melbourne we were told to think about herpetic eye disease all the time because once you swab the conjunctiva and send it to to the virology lab you'll get a pcr in typically 24 to 48 hours so that was you know it, it really depends on the on, on uh, the availability of resources as well and of course necrotizing herpetic eye disease is more of a clinical diagnosis um, than a pcr uh, this is typically what, what we see in pseudomonas infection, limbus to limbus uh, involvement with severe central thinning, impending perforation, ocular HSV, if it's a necrotizing disease, you will see loss of corneal tissue um, at a specific point, whereas the, the remaining cornea, it would be irregularly thin, but not usually not limbus to limbus, unless the patient has been on topical corticosteroids, in which case you will see limbus to limbus melting in ocular HSV as well. Inflammatory causes, um, they are hard to miss. Um, always take a good systemic history, you know, ask the patient about joint pains, oral ulcers, ulcers elsewhere in the body, ulcers on the scalp as well. Um, you will see there is a, there, sometimes there's a history of atopy as well. Patients might have history of allergic bronchitis, bronchial asthma, um, you know, um, uh, other skin manifestations, especially if they have rosacea keratitis. Rosacea keratitis, there was a lecture um, recently by uh, Professor Mark Menes. Again, one of the most underreported uh, eye diseases, ocular surface diseases in ophthalmology, which can lead to serious complications. Traumatic, as I mentioned, physical trauma, chemical injury, which I'm sure we still see a, a lot of that in, in, in India, unfortunately. We do see a lot of thermal injuries in the United States. All of them, them can be related to um, coronal perforation, either immediate or delayed, especially seen in chemical injuries. Neurotrophic, this is a picture of a zoster keratitis. Um, again, as I said, very commonly seen, unfortunately, after zoster of thalmicus infection. The cisterians margin de degeneration, as you can see, there's a typical lipid line seen close to the limbus. Um, these patients, they present with the perforations in the close to the superior limbus. Um, sometimes the cornea uh, will, will be thinned out sort of in a pinpoint position. You will see sweating um, of aqueous where you can uh, apply some glue. But another uh, scenario can be that there is complete thinning in, a, in, a, in the superior limbus and these patients will typically need a patch graft uh, in that area. Ectasias, um, this is a patient with, with pellucid uh, combined with globus like picture uh, presenting with spontaneous perforation. I, these are very difficult to seal. Um, 
you don't need to do a corneal transplant if you see a linear or an arc shaped perforation you can actually take the patient back to the or and put multiple stitches in that paracentral area um, and you will see surprisingly the, the cornea heals very well and there is associated flattening after you suture the cornea which will make future contact lens fitting easier for uh, visual rehabilitation. This is an algorithm which we came up uh, ages ago. Um, with, I was working with Dr. Vajpayee as a fellow in Melbourne. Um, you have to treat the associated conditions. If you're treating an infection um, and you have a coronal perforation, but you forget about the infection, you're not doing justice to the patient. You, you have to start fortified at some point. Um, for small perforations, you can do corneal glue. You can get away just with bandage contact lens and pinpoint perforations, especially if they're clean after thermal injuries or, or post-traumatic perforations. As Dr. Jang mentioned, you can do AMG, um, but that's a temporizing procedure. Tenon's patch has been described multiple times now from RP Center as well. You can do a DALK depending on the size and location of the perforation. I'll, I'll discuss that briefly. For large perforations, you have to do a therapeutic keratoplasty. And if it's, if it's pretty uh, large, limbus to limbus or beyond the limbus, you have to do a sclerokeratoplasty and the prognosis, visual prognosis is usually not great in these cases. How do you diagnose a perforation? Well, the age old and, and reliable sidles test. You just have to keep your eyes open. Um, and this is, I hope this works. Just for the, for the residents and you know, first year fellows, this was a patient that was glued. And you can see even now, from the edge of the glue, you can see the fluorescent, the aqueous leaking uh, and the saddles is positive. So if you create a mountain of glue, we'll talk about gluing in detail. If you create a mountain of glue, it's gonna be difficult um, to sort of take it off and put more glue. So this, that's not the right way to, to do corneal gluing. So medical management, as I mentioned, uh, very, very important especially infectious causes and immunological causes as well. Um, so you have to make sure that you, you do a complete workup to make sure it's, you know, to rule out any infections. Um, when you do think about unusual organisms, especially gram negative organisms such as Morixella, fung when you talk about fungus, it's mainly caused by filamentous fungi. Um, as I said, first question is, is it sterile or infected? Clues for infection, of course, you know, detailed history, contact lens wear, trauma, previous ocular surgery, on system examination. If you have a wet sort of picture uh, with a lot of pain and AC reaction, you will think more of, about infection. But if it's a sterile uh, coronal melt, you will have associated rheumatological causes as well, or history of HSV, or history of uh, um, dermatological involvement um, of, with, with zoster, of the, uh, zoster virus. When in doubt, always manage as if this is infected. Do not start steroids in corneal melt, um, especially prednisolone, unless you have ruled out infection. Even if it's an immunological cause, you have to speak to the rheumatologist and start uh, systemic immunosuppression if relevant before starting any topical steroid. If it's infectious, of course, you have to start intensive antimicrobials. 24 to 48 hours of fortifieds are not going to cause any harm. Um, uh, we've discussed this before in that slide, but yes, you know, quickly ocular surface diseases, they, will, they are easy to uh, diagnose onset lump examination, severe dry eyes related to Sjogren's syndrome, rosacea will have skin manifestations, exposure would be pretty obvious on lump examination. You can have a PED, persistent or chronic epithelial defect. And of course, history of trauma, foreign body in the eye, chemical injury, and also um, we do see it here. We might not see it uh, more in India. We still have patients who will come up with, um, with anesthetic abuse and, and corneal melting. Related to that, this is a picture of zoster melt. See how, you know, the eye, um, sorry, my screen just went. Hold on. All right. Um, you can see uh, in zoster melt, uh, melting, uh, there is severe thinning, but as I mentioned earlier, the thinning is, is not uh, limbus to limbus. Um, I'll skip that. So this is a, a picture of uh, rheumatoid arthritis related corneal melt, actually corneal scur melt. You can see how 
limbus and beyond the limbus, the cornea and sclera are, are, have, have thinned out and there's uveal tissue prolapse, although the anterior chamber is still maintained. Um, in history, again, external exam, uh, make sure you pick up scars for zoster, check coronal sensation, do a good Schirmer's test, and, and if possible, list them in green if it's available. And systemic investigations, if you do not have access to a rheumatologist, at least get basics done, such as CBC, ANA, rheumatoid factor, ESR, CRP, and ANCA. Uh, connective tissue diseases related males are typically peripheral. They can be central though, but they're typically unilateral, often associated with dry eyes. They may progress circumferentially, especially in rheumatoid arthritis, and they can be a presenting sign of connective tissue disease in about nine to 12% of patients. This is small perforation. Um, the leak is not visible, of course, this is a still picture, but the patient had rheumatoid arthritis and had multiple areas of thinning with secondary staph infection, and one of the areas of thinning um, had, had melted <coughs> inferiorly as well. Um, quickly, Moran's ulcer. Uh, book picture or book teaching tells us this is a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, which presents with painful peripheral ulceration with inflammation surrounding the, the conjunctival area as well. This can be unilateral or bilateral. It again, it extends circumferentially with and always has this overhanging edge and this can perforate pretty quickly. The unilateral form is usually seen in older patients. It's usually less aggressive, but the bilateral form is usually seen in younger patients and is more aggressive. This is a modernal ulcer patient which progressed um, quickly in a relatively young patient. As you can see, it looks terrible. Uh, more than also of, of both eyes in a patient, and again, in a young patient who was HIV positive. Terrian's margin degeneration, I've, we've shown the picture. You can see uh, a, a sort of a lipid line. As I said, the thinning and the perforation are usually close to the limbus in the superior area. If the patient is lucky and you are lucky, uh, the, the perforation will never happen. But sometimes the thinning, <coughs> excuse me, Thinning is very uh, aggressive and it progressive, uh, it's a, progresses very fast, leading to coronal perforation. Treatment, as we started off, uh, fortified antibiotics for Morexella. Um, you have to uh, use fluoroquinolones or gentamicin, which is usually better than tobramycin. For, you can use antifungals if you're suspecting fungus or you have fungus on uh, microbiology. Um, if you do not have access to voriconazole, always start with nadamycin or amphotericin B. Um, for antivirals, we give full dose acyclovir um, in the United States. Valtrex or valcyclovir is more commonly used uh, in, one, in a dose of one gram three times a day for a week, followed by one gram once a day or twice a day. We do have access to topical gancyclovir gel as well, but I typically don't use it because oral antivirals work much better than topical in these patients. Uh, while you are treating uh, corneal thinning and melt, make sure you optimize re-epithelization, use lots of lubricants as well. If you have to do a temporary tarsorephy, uh, not complete, temporary lateral tarsorephy or medial tarsorephy, depending on exposure, go ahead and get it done. And if you cannot use topical steroids, it is okay to use topical cyclosporin, even if you have to get it compounded. In post-traumatic perforations, it is all right to use topical glaucoma medications to lower the pressure. We use a lot of vitamin C, typically one gram a day. And of course, there are reports of using topical medroxyprogesterone in, um, in uh, place of using topical prednisolone in these patients. Oral doxycycline, we use it a lot. Uh, it inhibits uh, met matrix metalloprotein S9 and thereby uh, it slows down the melting process. Systemic steroids or systemic steroid sparing agents can be used as long as you have access to a rheumatologist. Um, let's uh, move on to coronal gluing. Um, gluing is typically used for, for perforations which are three millimeters or less, but I'll show you some videos which will you know, tell us that you can use gluing smartly, at least as a temporizing procedure while the patient is, is waiting for surgery. Synthetic glues are readily available, biological glues like fibrin, they are biodegradable. They are easily available, but there's a theoretical risk of transmitting blood-borne infections. 
I usually use cyanoacrylate adhesive, which I'm sure is very commonly used in India as well. It has got high tensile strength. And at least there is one study which has shown that this might have some bacteriostatic action as well. Fibrin, on the other hand, has low tensile strength. It's a two component uh, glue that comes in a single syringe. <clears throat> and of course it is expensive as well. Indications of glue. I always tell my patients that this is a procedure which we are doing today in the clinic because your perforation is small enough while you are waiting for the surgery. Um, about one third of the patients of coronal gluing, they would not end up having a surgery depending on where the perforation is, how peripheral the perforation is and how, um, how we treat the patients systemically. Um, again, AIMS, restore the integrity of the globe. I always show this picture um, uh, thanks to uh, my co-fellow Jacqueline Bells, who's now in Melbourne. Uh, this is the stuff that you need, um, at least I need. So a uh, chlorosig ointment, this is chloramphenicol, still very popularly, still very uh, commonly used in, in, uh, in Australia. Um, you can use any anti antibiotic ointment. This is a number 11 blade, cornea and glue, tuberculin syringe. This is, these are chloramphenicol eye drops. You can use moxifloxacin. <clears throat> this is preservative free topical anesthetic, uh, binoxinate um, or tetracaine, uh, a bandage contact lens and a dressing pack with Bexel sponges. This is a skin biopsy punch. <clears throat> we use a patch technique which has been uh, described in detail um, about 15 years ago. So basically you, um, you punch out um, patches from, corneal drape, from uh, ocular drape, ophthalmic drape, plastic patches. Then you use a Vexel sponge, dip it into uh, either chlorosig ointment or lignocaine gel. And then you uh, stick the, the plastic disc in front of that Bexel sponge. Dip this into a, a pool of cyanoacrylate glue and then put it on the side of kernel perforation. <clears throat> let's, let's look at this video. This was done um, on the set lamp with a speculum in patient's eye. So you dry the area around the kernel perforation. This is herpetic eye disease. Uh, and then you have that patch, as I said, let me just pause this. So this is the Vexel sponge or the Mirosil sponge. <clears throat> Sorry, this is a plastic patch. You have to determine the size of the patch according to the size of the perforation. I usually try and use a patch which is about at least one millimeter bigger than the size of the perforation. The patch has cyanoacrylate glue on, on the distal end, on the end, on the side that is facing the corner perforation. Once you have the area dry, you put the patch and then you wait for a few seconds. This is gonna dry out immediately. You can see in the edges, it's already drying out. So this prevents the creation of that mountain of glue. Um, and, and then you put a contact lens. We usually try and check uh, in about 15 minutes on set lamp if the chamber is forming. Uh, that's how the patient looks like um, on, on day one. Um, you can see still some glue has leaked on away, uh, leaked away from the, from the patch. But again, there's no mountain of glue and the contact lens will sit very nicely. This is another patient, I showed you the picture, necrotizing herpetic stromal keratitis, who ended up having multiple patches uh, because the patient was not interested in getting a corneal transplantation. <clears throat> you can leave the glue in place Post-operatively, you, you, you must use a mild steroid. We try to use fluoromethalone for the first few days. If you don't wanna use a steroid, at least use cyclosporin eye drops. Tell the patient that they might need a penetrating keratoplasty. Rarely, you can have infection after glue. Although, uh, you know, I've hardly seen cases in the past 10 years who got infected after glue unless you, you have a patient who actually has a fungal hypopion and then you're trying to glue the patient. Outcomes, as I said, all you need to remember is about one third of these patients, they would not require any treatment. One third will need some sort of uh, treatment um, and definitely one third will need uh, either lamellar transplant or full thickness transplant. And if you have uh, a failed a case with failed corneal gluing, gluing, you can either re-glue the patient, you can do an amnion, you can do a patch graft, 
You can do a tenon patch graft and you can do a tectonic keratoplasty. We will not be able to discuss all this because of limited time. I'm sure I'm already, uh, uh, you know, I've crossed my 15 minutes. This has been described by Dr. Namrata. Um, if you have a patient with dysmerocele, which is not perforated yet, you can try and do a dissection into that plane and try and do a deep limular keratoplasty in these patients. And of course, you know, there are patients which I'm sure that you see that are not that as clean as that dysmerocele, in which case do not be afraid <clears throat> to take the patient to the OR. Um, uh, one thing that I've learned over the years, mainly from RP Center, you know, from, from my teachers, Dr. Vajpayee, Dr. Namrata, Dr. Tashar as well, do not wait, if it is possible, do not wait for your patient to look like this. Um, and if there is no associated endothelitis, there is no reason for us to suggest uh, destructive procedures such as evisceration in these patients. Always try and salvage the globe if there's no endothelitis. I do use now a lot of intracameral antibiotics. As soon as I take off the cornea, I will use uh, vancomycin and sometimes voriconazole as well, depending on the microbiology. Never uh, miss the opportunity to send this corneal button for microbiology as well as for, for pathology, because if it, this is fungal infection that was not diagnosed before you took the patient to the OR, this is a golden opportunity to have that diagnosis so you can treat the patient postoperatively. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your kind attention. Sorry, I, I, I went uh, over time. Thank you, Vishal. I think you did a fantastic job. And uh, everything was uh, very well explained, uh, apart from the gluing procedure, I think, which is the most commonly uh, done procedure for corneal for patients. Dr. Anil, can we have the questions? Yeah. Hi, Vishal. Can I, have a, can I ask a question? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm wondering uh, how long does a person need to wear contact lens after corneal gluing? So Tim, you have to put the lens on until the, keep the lens on until the glue falls off. Um, I, I always remember a patient of mine who the glue didn't fall off until 11 months after the gluing. Um, so the patient came back every I don't call the patient back every two weeks when they have a contact lens on, you know, initially I can call them in every four weeks, but then I explain everything to them, return precautions and put them on a broad spectrum antibiotic like moxifloxacin. I see them every 10 weeks or so, two and a half to three months. Um, you have to put a contact lens on as, as long as the glue is on. So it really depends on how long the glue stays. Thank you. Any other question we have? We had one question, which I think uh, Gopal had posted from the YouTube. Anil? Yeah, that's about a patient who had a penetrating keratoplasty. How would you manage a pigment epithelial defect? I mean, not pigment, sorry. It's a epithelial defect. Sorry, PD for me is pigment epithelial detachment. Sorry. Pigment epithelial defect refer to retina? Consistent epithelial defect. I can try and, and, and answer that. So, as Dr. Jang mentioned, post surgery epithelial defects are really difficult to manage. Um, so, uh, lots of lubrication. Um, lots of anti-inflammatories as well. Um, as again, one thing that, that is underutilized is oral doxycycline, high dose. Um, there, is, there is not enough evidence because no one is interested in, in, in doing such studies. Um, uh, autologous serum eye drops as soon as possible. Um, I start at 20%, um, but there are multiple studies from, from Japan that have shown that you can go up to 50%. I have some patients post-surgery who are on 75% or even 100% serum, uh, concentrated serum eye drops as well. The problem with increasing the serum concentration is that it, it is more pro-inflammatory and not anti-inflammatory. So you, if, if the concentration is bumped up, you increase the level of MMP9 in, in these uh, serum eye drops. 
so it can have a, a opposite effect as well you can do a contact lens um, as Benny mentioned, you can do NGF if you have access to nerve uh, neurotrophic growth factor, of course, cost is an issue. But one thing that I've seen always works in post keratoplasty PEDs is uh, doing a tarsography. Uh, be patient, tell the patient that, you know, th we will close your eyelids shut, uh, about 75 to 80% will leave a small window so they can do uh, prednisolone eye drops or even cyclosporin eye drops. And I wait for at least six weeks before opening the tarsorapy. Um, so, so that's how I manage my patients with post keratoplasty um, persistent epithelial defects. Yeah, Dr. Vishal, uh, yeah. how can we uh, use a, the conjunctival tissue instead of uh, using that uh, plastic drape that you have? Uh, yes, so I have... did show you the video. Uh, you can use conjunctival tissue as well if the, you don't have anything else. The thing with conjunctival tissue is <clears throat> it's it's very vascularized. So surgery is not going to be easy. Um, and it might you might lose the conjunctiva in a few days. Uh, in, a, in place of conjunctival tissue, um, I'm sorry, I didn't show, the, show you the video. Uh, you can use a tenons patch graft. Um, it's easy to, to harvest tenons. There's a lot of tenons on the eye, especially if the non-surgical eye had never been operated or a patient is young. And you can use the tenons to plug that perforation. So, you know, there are videos online as well. Um, I have one somewhere as well. So I would suggest to use tenons instead of uh, using conjunctiva to plug these perforations. And, you know, I'm sure we have access, good access to Emneon um, in India um, because we, unlike other places, we procure the Emneon on our own and, you know, we, we use the Emneon um, in these patients. So cost is not a big issue. So any other, uh, <coughs> any other query or we'll... Vinay or Anil will move to the next one. Any specific, I just wanted to ask, any specific uh, uh, thought process when you are using in a diabetic patients because post-surgery, post-vitrectomy, some of these patients may have high intraocular pressure and their cornea may get steamy, uh, the edema, edematous epithelium, it may come off. Maybe intraoperatively there was one small area which doesn't heal properly. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in diabetic patients, what we do is if if the retina surgeons tell us that the epithelium came off and, you know, it wasn't looking very good during the surgery, we try and treat these patients aggressively while they are seen in the retina clinic. So if you can, the best option would be to start them on serum eye drops early during the post-operative period. <clears throat> but if you don't have access to serum eye drops, you can use frequent lubrication it is okay to use a bandage contact lens in these patients. Um, the trauma, the, the only thing that is stopping um, the epithelium to heal properly in a diabetic, uh, one, of course, is slow healing. And the second thing is the trauma from the eyelid. So if you don't have access to serum eye drops, you can put a contact lens that will not hamper your view when you look at the retina or you <laughs> want to see in the post-operative period. But we have to be very aggressive in these patients. I completely agree that this is a group of patients which we always know when they come out of surgery, especially long VR surgeries, they have trouble in healing of epithelium. I think if I may just add, apart from autologous serum, you can also use cord serum because <clears throat> that has uh, even higher concentration of the various uh, growth factors as compared to autologous serum. Of course, yeah. availability will be an issue. It will not be available at all centers. But uh, where uh, the gynae setup is there, uh, the cord serum can be uh, prepared uh, just like you prepare the autologous serum, except that once a cesarean section is uh, done from the placenta, the cord serum is, uh, you know, could be. I think Vishal has a has an experience of. Uh, yeah, well, my experience only comes from what I learned in RP Center. And, you know, uh, there are people around the world who are still using autologous serum. Uh, mm -hmm. It works very well. <clears throat> uh, most papers are from RP Center and, and the results are amazingly good. 
vitamin A levels are are quite good in UCBS, umbilical cord blood serum, as compared to AAS, autologous serum. There is a recent publication in a hematology journal from Italy that has reviewed the topic in detail and shown that UCBS works really, really well as compared to autologous serum. So I completely agree with that. You can move to the next one, Gopal. Okay, I'll I'll log off. Uh, sorry, yes, about yeah. that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you. No, no. Thank you so much for inviting me, um, Shizuka. Yeah. Sorry, I'll I'll I won't be able to listen to your talk. I want to say uh, good morning to Dr. Titiyal as well. I haven't seen him in a while. I hope you're doing well, sir. Good night. <laughs> good night, Vishal. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's my, you know, I hope I'm audible. It's great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shusuka Ko, uh, who is from uh, Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine. After doing her MDPSC from Osaka University, she did her research training in uh, University of Rochester. Her areas of interest is in visual function, dry eye, keratoconus, contact lenses, and other corneal diseases. Uh, we are extremely excited to have you here with us, Dr. Ko, today. Uh, please kindly share your screen and start your talk. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. So I'd like to uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, so can you see my presentation? Okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh, Again, uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening for uh, everybody. I'm Shizuka Ko from Osaka University. So it is my great honor to give a webinar talk today. The COVID-19 pandemic has altered the world in an unprecedented way and the impact of the pandemic have been felt the world over. Dry eye management for environmental and behavioral modification, visual display terminals, and mask wearing with attention to its effect on the ocular surface is increasingly important as this pandemic continues. Shown here is a recent review paper from SGRS. According to this paper, Dry eye may compromise results of corneal, cataract, and refractive surgery. Preoperative diagnosis and treatment of dry eye is important in that it can optimize preoperative measurement and to maximize postoperative outcomes and patient satisfaction. Wavefront measurement can tell how dry eye can affect optical quality. As you see here in the left side, deterioration can be observed in the wavefront spot pattern. After the tear film breakup, and sequential wavefront measurement shows visual disturbance in dry eye. Shown here is the latest definition of dry eye by due to report. I believe that most of you are familiar with this. I'd like to introduce the new perspective on dry eye by Asia Dry Eye Society. Based on the changes in the understanding of the types, symptoms, and signs of dry disease, ADES agreed to the concept of tear film oriented diagnosis and tear film oriented therapy, which evolved from the definition of dry eye, emphasizing the importance of a stable tear film. In this way, new perspective on dry eye has been proposed. This is a dry definition by ADES. 
Drea is a multifactorial disease characterized by unstable film, causing a variety of symptoms and or visual impairment, potentially accompanied by ocular surface damage. According to the ADES, dry eye can be diagnosed by the combination of symptoms and unstable tear film. Actually, it is highly dependent on tear film stability. With a simple tool, use of fluorescein, we can diagnose dry eye. Every ophthalmologist everywhere even non-dry specialists can use it. Of course, there are a lot of smart and nice imaging techniques, and they are helpful for deeper understanding of dry eye. However, fluorescent staining is an essential first step in ocular surface exam. Fluorescent staining is very useful we can assess the integrity of the corneal epithelium. Also, it enables us to visualize tear film. We can observe tear breakup and tear meniscus. Vidal's test and contact lens feeding assessment are the examples of visualization of tear film. Of course, fluorescent staining is an essential tool for dry eye diagnosis as well. Let me revisit the basic of fluorescent technique. I'd like to share some tips for use of fluorescent. Please apply the minimal amount of fluorescent. Use saline. Please do not use dry drops, which may affect the results and then shake well. The fluorescent strip is gently applied to the inferior palpebral conductiva with the patient looking up. If you apply excessive fluorescent, it extends tear break time and makes it difficult to assess ocular surface. Suggested BUT cutoff value is five seconds. As I mentioned previously, I suggest you to apply the minimal amount of fluorescent. It is ideal to use the metronome and average three measurements. Especially if you do some study, it is very important. But I know that you are very busy in your practice. So please measure BUT at least once. Please observe the whole cornea to detect the breakup area. Epithelial damage in cornea and conjunctiva are observed with fluorescent. Shown here is a typical dry eye cases. Generally, Epithelial damage are greater in conjunctiva than in cornea. In dry eye, staining in cornea is usually observed inferior, inferior or central part of the cornea. Again, epithelial damage are greater in conjunctiva than in cornea in dry eye. Moreover, damage to the conjunctiva Tyval epithelium precedes that of the corneal epithelium. Let me introduce blue free barrier filter. Usually, you observe fluorescent stain with a covered blue filter placed over the illumination system. If you add this blue free barrier filter, Actually, this is a yellow filter. It enhances the visibility of fluorescent staining, especially fluorescent staining in conjunctiva. So you don't need any uh, rose bangle or like this and green. These images are taken from the same eyes. 
it is difficult to detect mild or moderate conductible damage with the conventional method. However, we can observe fluorescent staining clearly with blue-free barrier filter. We can diagnose dry eye with simple three steps. One, subjective symptoms. Number two, abnormality in tear film. Number three, damage in ocular surface. Number two and number three parts can be ascertained with fluorescence. Combination of subjective symptoms and unstable tear film is a diagnostic criteria from ADES. It is highly dependent on tear film stability. To evaluate tear film stability, we only need fluorescence. Very simple. Based on tear breakup pattern of the pressure with fluorescence, we can classify dry eye into specific types as well. Let me share with you a little something extra tips. An efficient fluorescent staining can assist the differential diagnosis and optimal treatment. It is powerful in optimizing patient satisfaction as well. If you see such patchy pattern SPK, please suspect Sjogren syndrome. This pattern is typical for dry eye with Sjogren syndrome. Blood tests and referral to the rheumatologist are suggested. If you see corneal staining in the inferior cornea with a space between the upper and lower eyelid margin, please suspect lack of thalamus. Observation of conjunctival staining is helpful in differentiating between dry eye and drug toxicity. Generally, the epithelial damage are greater in conjunctival than in cornea in dry eye. In contrast, the epithelial damage are greater in cornea than in conjunctival in drug toxicity. This is very different. Show here are tips for drug toxicity. As I mentioned, fluorescent staining pattern is important. Please ask the patient about usage of eye drop in detail. Some patients use the eye drop so often. Actually, these patients use artificial tear drops more than 20 times a day. Treatment is to stop, stop the causative eye drops and use only saline. Observation of hidden area with fluorescent staining is a vital part of the ocular surface examination. These are major clinical cases. Superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis SLK is a chronic inflammatory disease of the superior vulvar conjunctival, limbus, and upper cornea. Usually, it is associated with dry eye. In this case, there are no staining here. However, staining in superior conjunctival is clearly observed. Conductival calysis is a common and frustrating of your surface condition that causes discomfort and pain. Here you can see the staining on the calysis area, which causes friction at every print. If the patient has the chances to see their conditions and the changes with treatment, it can motivate the patient to continue treatment. An educated patient will be more amenable to work with you. 
This is my take home message. Proper diagnosis of dry eye is key to certification. Again, use of resin is all that is needed. Thank you for your uh, thank you for attention. I think that was an excellent talk, Shizuka. So many, so many tips and tricks uh, just by you know fluorescein uh, staining, uh, which one can pick up, and so uh, uh, beautifully explained. Uh, Thank Dr. you very Vinay, much. Would, uh, very nice presentation, Doctor Vinay. Would you want to uh, comment on this? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it, and a lot of you know takeaway points, especially for you know, trainees and uh, uh, fellows. Now, uh, the one point I want to ask mm -hmm. Dr. Shushuka is that mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there is a lot of interest in, you know, the advanced, you know, or specific tests like MMP9 mm -hmm. and uh, osmolarity and all sorts of things. So in this whole gamut of dry eye disease spectrum, where do you place these tests? Does it really have any role in the present scenario? Okay, thank you for the question. So actually, I, of course, I, I think that inflammation is definitely uh, some associate, uh, have uh, some role, play a role in dry eye. But uh, actually in Japan, uh, we actually uh, tested uh, uh, osmolarity in dry eye, but we couldn't actually find any, we couldn't actually differentiate normal and dry eye. So, our conclusion from a Japanese researchers is actually, it seems like it doesn't work in Japan. So, and also right now, MAP9 uh, is not available, commercially available in Japan, but, but and unfortunately, information cannot be, cannot be observed at the street run. So my, actually, I think that it is very important to see actually to, so there should be there is some method to that everybody can use and diagnose dry eye. So this so I think the fluorescent staining is one of the I think maybe maybe the first one we can use it. Right, right. Easily available in every clinic. Every clinic. Yes. Right. yes. Uh, Madam Namrata, do you have any any uh, you know points to add to this about MMP nine and you know osmolarity in our setup? Well, I think MMP9 does play an important role, but it does have a cost to it. So that mm. is it. And then likewise, osmolarity, uh, it came uh, with a big bang, but then, you know, uh, it was shown that probably it was not that useful, but we still continue to do it because, uh, you know, that there are very few measures, objective measures, uh, in which, you know, you can monitor the treatment, uh, especially when you're giving drops. So... That is it. We are you doing MMP9 and uh, tear osmolality more for uh, uh, research purposes rather than for the mm -hmm. service component. So, uh, so actually, uh, so measurement of osmolality is popular in India. Uh, popular? Not, not many centers would not have. It. Yes, yeah, some of them would have it. Mm -hmm. yeah, true. But again, there is a cost to it, so the patient has to pay for the. Exactly. Any 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 uh, points comments from anyone else? Anil, you have to unmute, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shizuka. Yeah, can you answer? Are you audible? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Are you, you are you audible? Yeah, fine, fine. See, uh, I think uh, Dr. Shizuka is. Uh, I think her quite unpretentious in her uh, CV and all, but she has done a lot of work uh, regarding uh, tear dynamics and. Uh, the higher order abrasions and a lot of things that happen, especially in dry eye and keratoconus. Uh, so I really appreciate your work. And I think you are the best person probably to answer the uh, dry eye aspect of it, you know. Uh, I think uh, in the US, I think there is a lot of emphasis given for the inflammation as the cause for dry eye. But I think the Japanese society do not really fully agree. I think as a person who has experienced both sides uh, based on the experience in Rochester, and now in Japan, uh, what is more suitable for Asians? I, f I also personally feel that the, uh, the role of inflammation is slightly uh, overhyped. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so 
first, I, I'd like to say, so we, we don't totally actually uh, deny information, of course, uh, but the key, key, the key is the Japanese researchers actually think that the, maybe the TFM stability, instability is a kind of, kind of key component for dry eye. Of course, inflammation, especially in dry eye with sugar and syndrome associated, I think. But right now in Japan, uh, we don't have any uh, cyclosporine uh, eye drop, but sometimes I really need, actually need some kind of inflammation drop as well. But in that case, actually, we are, right now we are using uh, 0.1% uh, chromesorone. Yes. I think you use a lot of uh, duquesne for sol and erbapamide. You use quite mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's uh, not very much available in India. I don't know why. Now there is a shortage, especially. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you feel yeah. that? And uh, do you, what is your experience with uh, erbapamide? But I, I know uh, when I went to India two years, maybe, maybe last year and two years ago, I no, I noted uh, there is a domestic levamipide uh, eyedrop in India, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it used okay. to be there. It used to used be, there, to be? But now, yeah, now it's not available. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, definitely it works because uh, both Ziquafoso and levamipide, is, is, they, these are targeting uh, mucin, mucin, yes. the mucin situation. So definitely, especially for the dry eye with um, Music deficient type of dry eye, I think it works. I hope uh, these are these eye drops are available in India mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, I hope so too. We don't have that. Madam, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to ask Dr. Shisuka about uh, tear fluid. So it's a very accessible fluid. Are not at all invasive, it is easily available. So there are lots of diseases inside the eye which are inflammatory, which have, uh, you know, maybe uh, not so overt inflammation like even diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular inflammation, all are cytokine-driven. So do you think that tear fluid analysis would be, see, the other way we can look at biomarkers inside the eyes through aqueous, mm -hmm. which is more invasive. So do you think that tears can provide a more better source than blood in studying these biomarkers for subclinical inflammation? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I think definitely a uh, tear film is a, we, we can actually pick up no invasively. So everybody actually are looking for that. And of course, uh, of course, another, another option is actually using uh, combination with contact lens as well. Yes, I think this is a good way. So I'm not sure uh, how, 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 the, how the studies are going, but definitely uh, many researchers are interested in, even the other uh, uh, inter internal medicine doctors are also uh, uh, interested in to picking up tear film as a biomarker. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Sir, you're muted. Sir, Good morning, muted. sir. You're muted, muted morning, sir. sir. You're muted, sir. Just wanted to add uh, one uh, thing. Like, uh, we have used, you know, chloroquine phosphate eye drops for this uh, mild to moderate dry eyes patients, which would have uh, some sort of an inflammatory component also. We have found that uh, chloroquine eye drops uh, does help in... Uh, decreasing their symptoms, signs also, and it is quite effective uh, in a, uh, routine cases as well as patients with a systemic association also. We found that people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, other uh, you know, uh, collagen vascular disorder, other uh, autoimmune disorders, they did benefit with uh, this eye drop. I think people have to work out uh, all these inflammatory markers in these cases. We also did an MMP9 in these cases. So it is a, another tool with us which can be used for these mild to moderate dry eye patients. So you mentioned uh, chloroquine? Chloroquine. Chloroquine, chloroquine, chloroquine phosphate. Oh. Yeah. Is it which, also right now uh, currently available in India? Yes, yes, it's, it's available in India mm -hmm. and it is uh, 
0.03 percent, mm -hmm. and uh, it's quite effective in some uh, patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one more question uh, regarding dry eye. I mm -hmm. think uh, there is a lot of disparity between the objective signs that you see and the complaints of the patient. You, know? you see a patient with Sjogren's, uh, uh, especially secondary Sjogren's, your, the whole cornea would be having punctate erosions, but uh, you don't see the patient is complaining at all. While uh, the more evaporative dry eyes, they, they, they really come up with symptoms and you don't see anything in the slit lamp. Uh, so, can you, how much of uh, that can be really accounted, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I totally agree. This is a kind of our, oh, it is always actually our, actually, we, it actually bothers us. Mm -hmm. yes. I think uh, that will be, that is an age-old uh, controversy, and then which just doesn't seem to go away, uh, the disparity between the subjective and the objective. Uh, uh, diagnosis and uh, the symptoms. But I think we are, as far as dry eye is concerned, in terms of investigations, also, although there is a plethora of investigations, but we are still not there. There's a very uh, good uh, module which uh, Shankar Netrale has come out with on dry eye. I don't know, Shweta, if you are there, and or Vinay, if you are there and you know about it, uh, either of you can uh, tell us about it. And in that, I think. Uh, they have developed a very nice software. Yes, yeah. Can you tell yeah. us about it? Shweta, first, 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 first hand information. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is a dry eye app that we have developed. It's basically a web-based app. And uh, the primary aim is to bridge the gap that we have right now of uh, a proper documentation and uh, a workup of the patient. So it basically goes through the entire history. And with a click of a button, it gives you the entire diagnostic sheet. So it tells you the grade of the dry eye, the component of aqueous tear with meibomian gland dysfunction. And uh, we also have a cornea rheumat interface sheet. So uh, it basically uh, connects the ophthalmologist with, helps connect the ophthalmologist with the rheumatologist and includes the uh, information that as uh, an ophthalmologist, we would need to provide to them for better understanding of the disease, which would be mutual again. And there are a few uh, uh, points like the DAS score, which the disease activity score that we would like to have from the rheumatologist to know how active or under control the underlying uh, connective tissue disorder is. So just by filling up the Shermer's, the tear breakup time and the fluorescein staining by the uh, ophthalmologist, we would be able to get the entire diagnostic uh, sheet to, you know, help us manage these patients better. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. I think, uh, Anil, if there are no comments, then we can move to the next talk. Uh, yes, ma'am, we can. Thank you so much, Shuzuka. Thank you so oh, much for joining. Thank in. You. It is mine? Okay, sorry. I thought it was uh, microbial keratitis. Anyway. Okay, I will uh, just share the screen. Dr. Namrata Sharma does not require any introduction. Yes. As I said. No. Yeah. As you said at the beginning, <laughs> one person who doesn't need, you know, we need not even say a word about. No, no. Everybody here is so renowned that they need no introduction. And please. I will uh, talk about this topic, uh, which is... Uh, replacement uh, technique for uh, uh, for corneal pathologies or component surgery of cornea, uh, which has now uh, become a revolution. There are uh, no uh, financial or uh, proprietary interests. And we moved a long way, uh, almost 116 years, uh, when we used to do full thickness uh, penetrating keratoplasty. And now, uh, I think after some time, we'll have to uh, relearn it because we are so much into lamellar keratoplasties. And depending upon where the corneal pathology is, if it is there in the anterior corneal uh, uh, stroma, then we do manual lamellar keratoplasty or automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty. If it is there in mid to posterior stroma, then we do deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. And if it involves a disease, there's mesmembrane and endothelium, then we do a, a DSEC procedure or a DMEC procedure 
where we uh, replace the uh, disease Desmet's membrane in endothelium either with stroma and endothelium like in DSEC or only with endothelium like in DMEC. So uh, this is just to show how at each of the levels uh, uh, one can do a different procedure. So uh, again, when you are doing a anterior lamellar keratoplasty, uh, if, if it is just anterior to mid stroma, like in advanced keratoconus, one can just do Bowman layer transplantation. If it is superficial up to 150 microns, it is SALC. Uh, superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty, 250 or 350 microns, it is automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty. If uh, the level is at 90% stroma, then it is a pre desmetic DALC. If there's complete bearing of desmet's membrane, then it is a um, uh, desmetic uh, DALC. And of course, for the endothelium desmet membrane complex, if you have some amount of stroma, then it is DSEC. If you have no amount of stroma, then it is DMEC. And if you have a pre desmet's layer or DUA's layer with desmet's membrane and endothelium, then it is PDEC. So this was a technique uh, uh, which was described by Dr. Mellis group, uh, Bowman layer transplantation in the treatment of keratoconus, in which only Bowman's membrane is fashioned uh, manually. And uh, this is then uh, inserted uh, uh, through a pocket, which is created uh, in, in, into the, uh, in, in, in a case of, in cases of keratoconic cornea, so that it acts as a splint and it is also strained so that you can actually see where it is and how it has unfolded. Uh, it is, uh, Bowman's layer is an acellular and sutureless graft and it allows the stabilization of keratometry, helps in improvement of best corrected visual acuity and also helps in stabilization of the corneal ectasia. The long-term results of this technique are uh, not there. Uh, this was a technique which is described in 2018. And ever since 2018, we have few patients and uh, we do require long-term uh, uh, results of these patients to say uh, how it works and where it works. Then came the revolution uh, automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty, which was uh, inspired by the LASIK surgery. And uh, in this, uh, it was technically easy to dissect both the donor and the recipient. It was less time consuming. There was smooth post and donor cut and the thickness was nearly exact with no interface problems. So you can do it in cases uh, such as this. And uh, some of the cases, it may not be possible to dissect the host, such as in this case. So another technique, which is called as HALC or hemi-automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty came into being, which was described by Dr. Donald Tan and Dr. Jodhir Mehta, wherein the manual dissection was done on the recipient, uh, but the uh, donor was fashioned using an automated uh, microkeratome. And uh, this is just to show how automated lamellar therapeutic uh, keratoplasty is done. So this is a 350 micron uh, microkeratome head, which is being used to uh, split the cornea. You have anterior 350 and posterior uh, 150. So the posterior 150 can be used for uh, posterior lamellar keratoplasty. And this is a keratoconic cornea in which uh, the uh, uh, section is done at the level of uh, 250 microns. Uh, following which uh, the uh, donor button, which has previously been harvested, is then placed and is tightly sutured, uh, as is advocated for cases of keratoconus, using 10 monofilament nylon sutures. Now, there is an interface with ALTK, as would be expected, uh, just like in manual lamellar keratoplasty, but this interface is quite clear, as can be uh, seen here. And these are some of the results way back uh, in 2003 when we did uh, a thesis on automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty and Dr. Vasudendra uh, from Karnataka was the thesis candidate. Uh, uh, these are the results way back from that time. So if you look at the results uh, of the various studies and this is the updated um, uh, review, not too much has happened after 2018 because uh, ALTK has uh, become the standard of care. Astigmatism in most of the cases that you do is less than four diapter and the best corrected visual acuity better than 612 is uh, obtained in almost 70 to 94% of the cases. Uh, this is a technique sutureless anterior lamellar keratoplasty and a very elegant paper from our colleague Dr. Tushar Agarwal uh, with FECO emulsification. And the idea is again in this that uh, if it is uh, superficial, then you probably don't need to put the sutures. 
so the uh, dissection is uh, done very much how you would do in um, ALTK as was uh, shown uh, previously and this is the only thing is this graft is a little thinner so it is about 200 microns and this is a case of healed keratitis with uh, cataract with uh, um, uh, with the uh, spheroidal degeneration so in this uh, the graft is uh, uh, fashioned and you have to do it at the same speed the donor and the recipient to get the thickness which is nearly exact and after uh, gluing it uh, one uh, just leaves it like this because in the post op period uh, you actually don't need sutures uh, because the graft sticks with the help of the glue now this was a technique that i was uh, showing you earlier that there are times and situations when you cannot do a automated uh, uh, microkeratome cut on the recipient mainly because it is too irregular or it is too thinned out so in such cases you may have to hand dissect uh, or manually dissect the recipient but the donor can be done on an automated microkeratome and again uh, there are not very many publications of health uh, uh, and most of them are from a single group uh, from singapore and they have shown uh, good results and long term study long term results are also now uh, there uh, which again show uh, uh, optimal results now then as you go deeper you can have various methods of doing deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty which could be layer by layer manual dissection or hydro delamination or viscoelastic assisted uh, deep anterior uh, lamellar keratoplasty which is described by malis or air assisted described by arkela but the gold standard remains the big bubble technique which was uh, described by dr um, anwar and of course the advantages is that you have removed the entire disease tissue the desmets membrane is there so the smooth graft bed is there and there's virtually no interface at all it can be done for uh, various situations which include ectasias uh, primary or after surgery like post lasic post intacts then stromal dystrophies uh, which are involving the entire stroma even ocular surface disease and uh, desmetoceles of course contraindications relative i would say now because uh, in heel head drops also we are doing dal but endothelial involvement is a, a complete contraindication and it should not be done in uh, those cases the donor tissue with poor endothelial quality can be taken but one should avoid tissue with a heavy arcus and a backup good quality tissue should always be available when you are doing dal now this was the first technique of dal which was described by malis so air bubble is instilled inside the anterior chamber a 400 micron groove is made lamellar dissection is then done uh, from uh, uh, limbus to limbus this is followed by injection of the viscoelastic as you can see here and then you suture the incision now this is subsequently followed by trifination which is done on the recipient bed and uh, after uh, doing the uh, trifination over the viscoelastic cushion because that had initially been placed in the pocket uh the uh, excision of the graft is done so one is not at the level of the desmets membrane but near desmets membrane level because some amount of stroma would still be there but it serves as its purpose uh, and this was a case of keratoconus again where tight suturing is done now with the advent of the sixth layer of the uh, cornea that is duas layer and this is nothing but condensation of the stromal keratocytes on the desmets membrane things uh, became a little different in the way we do the surgery so uh, two types of big bubbles were described big bubble is when you inject air into the corneal layer so type 1 big bubble would be when it is above duas layer and because it is above duas layer and this is the stromal uh, keratocyte concentration you have a rough surface and type 2 big bubble is below duas layer so duas layer is out so you have a smooth surface so uh, it is important to recognize these bubbles uh, but uh, i would just give you one example of how we can after doing partial thickness trifination 60 to 70% can instill air bubble and then this is type 1 big bubble uh, as soon as you instill the air the desmets membrane it falls back if you are in the correct plane and this can be appreciated on the uh, intraop oct microscope not that you need it but it becomes a bit easier if you have it then uh, you give a nick in the overlying stromal layers and just as you give a nick in the overlying stromal layers the desmets membrane it marches up and uh, as it uh, marches towards the overlying stromal layers you know that you are in the correct plane now, this is subsequently again reinforced with the help of the viscoelastic cushion so the desmets membrane falls back 
and the overlying stromal layers are split with the help of the Warner scissors. And you have a bare Desmet's membrane, which is now looking at you and a full thickness donor cornea from which the Desmet's membrane has been removed is then sutured with tenjero monofilament nylon sutures. Of course, uh, this was not done under intra OCT microscope, but this is a case of hurlers for which uh, DALC was done many years ago. And the patient uh, at 12 years follow-up is still doing well and you've still not entered the anterior chamber. These are again some of the cases in which DALC was done. Can be done for other situations as well. Probably for trichomatous keratopathy, it's an overkill because uh, you can get away by doing uh, ALTK or manual LK. But it does help in macular uh, dystrophy. And one can even do a pre-desmetic uh, DAL, especially in cases of healed hydrops. So this is just a case to show how when you can see the healed hydrops on intra opposite microscope, you can do a manual layer by layer DAL. And important thing is that uh, one does trifination and then very carefully and gently you go just layer by layer. And as you come in the area of the scarred area or in the area of the healed high drops, which can be seen on the IOCT, which can also be made out if you don't have it, uh, just by looking at the uh, anatomy there. You can notice that this area, which was actually the healed high drops has moved a little paracentral here. And once that moves little paracentral, you know the pupil is almost kind of spared here. And then one can do, uh, uh, in cases of healed high drops, DALC, and the visual acuity would be good. It's layer by layer. So there is some amount of 66 microns or 62 microns of stroma, which is still there, but then that's fine. The procedure is extraocular. Again, you can do layer by layer DALC for cases in which you've done either slit or clet chemical injury cases. And again, one can look at the uh, uh, bed and see when it just gets completely clear. And when you have this uh, almost clear bed, although there is some amount of stroma, one can suture the graft onto it. So it does help in cases of uh, uh, chemical injury as well. And this is a case of post talc after sled. And of course, this classical picture, uh, desmetosil, for which uh, DALC was given. And I think uh, Dr. Tatyal sir was the first one to suggest that we should do DALC for desmetosil. So all credits to him for this. Then uh, this is a case of uh, dermolipoma uh, in which lamellar keratoplasty was done. And this is a one-eyed child uh, who's now almost uh, uh, eight years of follow-up is now doing graduation with this single eye because the other eye is thysis. So you can help such patients uh, to at least uh, you know, do even their uh, studies and to make their careers. You can have problem uh, with the DALC, such as desmet membrane folds, uh, but they do disappear over time. Then there can be desmet membrane detachment, such as this, but we can inject air bubble or C3F8, and uh, these do are taken care of. Then you can have graft rejections. And again, if you give topical steroids, uh, it does clear up. Uh, I will very briefly discuss about the peripheral corneal ectasias, uh, such as uh, keratoglobus. Uh, which are, uh, or uh, the tuck-in lamellar keratoplasty, which has been described for PMD, keratoglobus, post-PK keratoconus. And very recently, we've also got a paper now, post-RK keratectasia, tuck-in lamellar keratoplasty, where it helps. And the important thing is that, I think I will, uh, this is the pre and the post-op uh, picture of the same. And this is post RK ectasia for which uh, TELC has been uh, done uh, with uh, very good results and the flattening of the uh, cornea uh, also occurs uh, in this case as can, as can be uh, seen here. And uh, I think all these are not plain, but anyway, the idea is that the peripheral part of the uh, tissue is, uh, is stuck inside the uh, pocket which is created uh, into a thinned out area. So this is a case of pellucid marginal degeneration and this is uh, tucked inside. And once you tuck inside, this gets, uh, the peripheral part gets uh, reinforced. And this is just to show the same that the periphery, peripheral part which is thinned out has now uh, been reinforced. And by a single stage procedure, you not only have visual rehabilitation, but also tectonic uh, stability. Now coming to the uh, endothelial keratoplasty, uh, this I've already discussed how we can replace it. 
and it is indicated whenever your endothelium is compromised, such as bullous keratopathy, fixed dystrophy, failed keratoplasty, eye syndrome, shed. Uh, we've got a paper which is now uh, recently accepted, uh, DSEC for shed cases. Uh, corneal decompensation can occur post glaucoma surgery, and this is attention for Dr. Gopal Pillai, even post VR surgery, if the cornea gets decompensated, we can do it. So the advantages of DSEC is again, that you don't have problems uh, which uh, are related to open sky procedures. You don't uh, have uh, problems of say, expulsive hemorrhage. There are less surface sutures, uh, predictable topography, hardly any astigmatism, preserves the corneal nerves and visual rehabilitation is very fast. Plus the rejections are less because you have you are transplanting less tissue uh, onto the onto the host. I think this I already uh, showed you how uh, we would have uh, prepared the graft for the uh, DSEC. And this is the 150 microns from the corneoscleral rim that is left is loaded onto the Buson's glide. Uh, this is a case of pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. So this graft is being uh, intracamerally injected and is being pulled with the help of the ILM peeling forceps. And then uh, when the graft is there inside the anterior chamber, air bubble is instilled so that the graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea and also provides endothelial cells. So there are no sutures and this is ultra thin DSEC when you uh, make the grafts even thinner because the thinner graft is going to give you better quality of vision in terms of better contrast sensitivity and uh, uh, aberrations also, which will be much less. So either you can fashion your graft using double pass technique where you use a 350 micron head and then you use a 100 micron head or a 250 micron head and then a 100 micron head or alternatively, you just use a single head that is a 400 micron head. So uh, this is the study that we published where we compared single pass versus double pass technique in DSEC. And we found that in cases where single pass was used, the contrast sensitivity was better. Of course, uh, we've published this already, one donor cornea for three recipients, and now people have published for four recipients, anterior part to be used for anterior lamellar keratoplasty, posterior for a DSEC procedure. And again, if the limbus is healthy, then you can even do a limbal stem cell transplantation. So uh, this is uh, something we have published. Now we, I come to the most physiological graft that is now available to replace the corneal endothelium. And that is the uh, Desmet's membrane roll. So this is uh, uh, first stained with the trapan blue dye stripped at 360 degrees with the help of the Sinsky. And the whole graft is detached or the Desmet's membrane is detached from all four sides uh, and rolled uh, right up to the center and then it is laid back because it is a graft which is very difficult to handle. This is followed by trifonation, which is about eight and a half millimeters. Then stain again, remove the uh, peripheral part, which is kind of noise, and then uh, strip the uh, Desmet's membrane roll. And this is the most physiological replacement of the uh, corneal endothelium. And once you have this, this can be... Uh, this is a, was a case of Fuchs with cataract for which cataract surgery was done. Uh, this is followed by desmetorexis, uh, which is then done. Uh, so the diseased desmet's membrane is being removed with the help of the reverse Sinsky. And this is uh, followed by the graft, uh, which had been previously prepared, injected, uh, is being placed inside the injector and subsequently uh, is injected intracamerally. And then you just tap, tap, to get it into the correct configuration of the biceps curl upwards. This is downwards, so it's an upside down graft. So to get those biceps curls upwards, just like you have in biceps, now this is the biceps curl upwards, and then it is endothelial side down. You can be absolutely sure about it. And then you inject the air bubble and the graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea. And you can hardly make out that there was ever a graft uh, which was done for this, except if you very closely see on the slit lamp or you get an anterior segment OCT done for this patient. This is again, we've published this in uh, clinical ophthalmology. You can even do it in KC medias by using the introp OCT microscope. This is an eye syndrome. Again, this is uh, accepted for publication. Uh, this is DMET for fa failed DSEC post penetrating keratoplasty. So, a penetrating keratoplasty graft was there, and then we did a DSEC and that failed. 
And then for that, uh, we are now replacing it with, with DMEC, uh, which we now uh, know much better. And earlier we didn't know that. So this is the DMEC graph. Again, we loaded into the correct configuration only. So loaded into the correct configuration, uh, get it uh, intracamerally there, get it into a bicep curl upwards. And once uh, you have the bicep curl upwards, look at that S which is staring at you in the right configuration, which means it is endothelial side down. And then uh, like an umbrella, the graft unfurls and it gets again adhered to the stoma. So this is uh, what we published uh, MIOCT guided DMAC in corneas with poor visualization. So with DMAC, the endothelial cell loss is now comparable uh, and uh, with the advent in technique and technology, uh, although uh, earlier cases did have greater detachment rates. Uh, so the graft survival is also now optimal and uh, it's a thin graft. So there is no hyperopic shift at all. Of course, it does have a learning curve. Now coming to PDEC, I find the advantage of PDEC being that even the younger donors can be taken to do endothelial keratoplasty. You don't have to wait for older donors to do uh, uh, to replace this. And this is just to show how a big bubble is being formed in the corneoscleral uh, donor cornea. This is followed by the injection of the um, testaments uh, of the tripan blue, which strains it completely. And then this part, of course, I think really needs refinement and I don't like to do it this way. And we are just trying to figure out how best we can do it. The cutting of the edges of the graft with the Vana scissors. So I think this would lead to some amount of uh, uh, losing of the endothelial cells. And this is your graft there, it looks ragged. And I think this is something which we need to work on. And this is a case of uh, um, uh, pseudo keratopathy again, in which the Smith's membrane is removed. Uh, this is followed by the uh, this is followed by the injection of the graft in the goiter's cannula, just like you would do for a DMEG graft, and then the graft is uh, placed intracamerally in, inside. And of course, if you have an air pump, it gets better. This was uh, one of the first cases, but again, note again here also you should have that biceps curl upwards. So air is being instilled, and over the air, it is easier to move the graft. So it is being uh, spread again like an umbrella onto the uh, bare stroma. And uh, this is the post-op picture where it is now uh, epithelizing. Again, the graft is very thin. It is hardly uh, 16 microns. So we've used one cornea for two recipients, DALC and DMEC. And uh, in fact, this was the first case uh, of DMEC that I had done and uh, we used DMAC and then we thought that we have the other part left. So we did it uh, dealt with this and this is a possibility. This is something uh, which we've done. Uh, again, uh, we've done few cases, uh, but femtosecond laser assisted keratoplasty can be done. This is how a donor cornea is uh, uh, being uh, split to show that uh, how it can be cut with the help of femtosecond. Only thing is that as you go deeper, uh, it becomes a little irregular. So we are really not uh, there. This is the last uh, clip that I would be showing you in which bioengineered corneas or synthetic corneas are being uh, placed intrastromally, intrastromal keratoplasty so that uh, we can uh, uh, make this pocket. And uh, this was uh, not done with the uh, Visumax. This was done with the uh, wave light, with the uh, Alcon laser. So we have to make that uh, pocket over there with the help of the blade. And this is the synthetic cornea, which is made up of recombinant uh, collagen. This is folded uh, just like we used to fold the olden, olden intraocular lenses. And this is then placed inside. And subsequently, uh, this is then uh, unfolded inside the pocket. In the initial uh, part, there is uh, edema which is present which subsides and now we have uh, results of 15 cases. And again, this uh, was done as a collaboration. So this has again gone into publication. So to conclude, I would say that uh, component surgery of cornea replacement therapy is here to stay. Refinements and techniques and modifications will be there. But we do need to learn full thickness penetrating keratoplasty because that still remains the commonest cause of uh, 
a commonest uh, uh, surgery which we perform as per the EBI statistics in our country. So these are our books. Uh, we are coming out with the second edition of this book very soon. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Yeah, uh, thank you Mayim, for that exhaustive talk. I think it covered almost all the aspects and uh, highlighted the uh, essential differences between the different techniques. Uh, do we have any questions or else I can shoot my questions? Vinay or uh, any of the... Uh, please go ahead. Okay, are there any questions from YouTube? I mean... Ma'am, uh, I have a question in uh, automated lamella keratoplasty. Uh, quite often, uh, uh, there will be the irregular uh, central part. No, so as you make that sliver, central area there may be a, a perforation or a very thin area. Uh, you know, I agree with you completely. I also feel that some of the cases where help has been described or done, you could get away with ALTK because they were less severe cases and the cases which are more severe, you could probably do a DAL. So it's a, uh, the spectrum for HALC is I think uh, very limited. And uh, I completely agree with you that at times there may be excessive thinning and you may not be able to match the, the tissue which you cut through the microkeratome with a bed, which is irregular and you know has, having those, uh, uh, those uh, craters and valleys. So uh, it may become difficult and uh, it's best in those cases to go right up to the desmet membrane and dissect it and then do a DALC rather than a HALC. Because the donor tissue is going to be the same. I mean... Yeah. Uh, you showed that the glue, no ma'am? So sometimes uh, if you just put it in the periphery, it is nice, but sometimes the sliver of glue will go into the center and then there can be that interface haze which can be troubling for quite some time. I oh, completely agree with you on this. Uh, uh, Dr. Tushar does a lot of uh, SALC in our center and he's uh, described you know, the exact method of doing it. We've also done uh, some cases. But yeah, that possibility is definitely there. One has to be careful about this. You to keep tapping the whole thing with the iris repository, keep tapping it onto the edges so that you know uh, the glue, rather than coming inside the interface, if at all, goes outside and drains outside the cutter. Uh, uh, hi, Professor Namarata. Hi, Can I have a question? Okay, yeah. uh, so it might be uh, not today's topic, but I'm wondering how is the situation for uh, PTK, PTK in India? So PTK is... Uh, Again, very common, and there are a lot of cases where you can do PTK, like you know, recurrent corneal erosions or Salzman mm -hmm. nodular degeneration. I think the paper that we published, the maximum number of cases were in Salzman nodular degeneration, where you know you can remove the Salzman nodules manually and then do a PTK to smoothen the surface. Or PTK uh, has been described for so many other procedures also. So that option, of course, does remain here, which is a transplant sparing uh, procedure, mm -hmm. and uh, it can be done. Vinay and Anil can also give opinion on PTK. Yeah, yeah. I think the limitation is we have to, uh, basically, we can't uh, 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 ablate a lot of cornea there. If you go beyond 100 microns, the amount of uh, hypropia that you create would be very severe. So, and uh, there is some irregularity in the bed also. So I think uh, we definitely we do, definitely we do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, other aspect in our population is, uh, you know, the financial aspect when, they, when you take them to take them compared to, you know, as uh, when I hand, can you hike up your volume, please? Yeah, the other, the second thing is uh, the financial burden to the patient, yeah, you true. know, compared to a simple superficial keratotomy. That kind of prevents a lot of cases which can actually be, uh, you know, taken under uh, laser for PTK. So PTK is not a medically uh, covered insurance, not covered, right? PTK is uh, no, it will it is covered in the insurance companies. Although I really don't know whether it meets up to the cost of the laser and the bandage contact um. in 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 the 
in, in government institution like ours, the patient doesn't pay except for the bandage contact lens, but I'm sure in private setups, you have to pay for the laser and the, and the contact lens both and the surgical fees and you know, OR charges, whatever they are. Ma'am, regarding the Bowman's transplantation, uh, I think it again came with a big bang. I just want to know what is the status now. And uh... personally, I've done only two Bowman's layer transplantation, and frankly, in uh, both of them, I did not see much of a difference. Although uh, the studies say otherwise, so uh, uh, I think uh, we need to do it more to see, you know, whether it is really working or not. And we also need to see how it will compare with other techniques. There are a lot of now uh, techniques which are described where people have put uh, bioengineered lenticules in such cases. The idea is just splinting. So bioengineered lenticule, people have even put donor corneas split, I mean, human tissue, and then they have, have 100 microns or 200 microns of donor cornea cut after ALTK and then, you know, put inside. So those kind of things uh, really need to see. But I think in all these things, the important thing is that you need to have a large uh, size. So it has to be more than nine millimeters because if you have uh, eight or eight and a half, then it doesn't serve the purpose, especially in keratoconic corneas. Uh, so uh, that is uh, something which has to be uh, you know, kept in mind. Uh, what about, um, we do prefer to do uh, DALC in people in whom there is a lot of devascularization. Because in a lot of these patients, you see the vessels coming into the interface and bothering you. Uh, so DALC, I think, uh, if you see the vessels, uh, I have never seen vessels on Desmet's membrane. So they yeah. are there only in the stroma. In the serious stroma. And most cases, you would think, you know, that probably the Desmet's membrane is not going to be clear and it's going to be absolutely white, especially chemical injuries, but you'll be surprised to see how clear it can be when you, you know, reach there. So uh, vessels to my mind will not be a contraindication for DAL. Uh, the only thing is that if you leave some, provided you are able to do a desmetic DAL, if it is a pre-desmetic DAL and there are some vessels there, then it's very likely that those vessels will proliferate and will be there in the interface. So I think the nidus of uh, angiogenesis has to be uh, uh, completely, uh, you know, has to be completely, or it should not be there at all, in fact, for you to do uh, DALC in such cases. So if you can do a desmetic DALC, it is uh, well and good for such cases because vessels will not come again if you have reached up to the desmet's membrane level. But if some amount of stroma is there, then it is uh, very likely that the uh, vessels will again regrow into the interface. Anil, can I ask one question? Why not? <laughs> Gopal says, no, I get scared. <laughs> <laughs> no. emanate from retina and I would know nothing about it. <laughs> no, madam. Uh, one thing is, the first question is, uh, how close are we to you know, uh, 3D print out transparent corneas. 3D printing and all. Uh, I mean, because, yeah. 3D printing the corneas, we are quite close to it. The only flip side which people have not been able to address is that there are no uh, endothelial cells in it. So 3D printing, if you see for lamellar grafts, we are there. And bioengineered corneas, we are there. Synthetic corneas, we are there. But to grow endothelial cells onto the uh, onto the uh, biosynthetic lenticule or onto the printed cornea, that is something you know which we are struggling with. And all the three D uh, printed corneas, and now the recent one that has come is from Corny. They are there, but you know the long term results are not there. That is something uh, which we need to see. Okay. And the other thing is, ma'am, when you have a penetrating keratoplasty, many times you require to do read transplants because of failed grafts. So uh, if there is, can we have a lamella transplant on top of a failed penetrating keratoplasty or you will always go for either a re-keratoplasty or uh, uh, keratoprosthesis? 
So there is an excellent paper, I think uh, Dr. Chityal sir uh, uh, initiated that study and it is published in American Journal of Ophthalmology. How for failed grafts, you know, what is the outcome of, of those failed grafts? And if sir is able to tell us about that, sir, are you there? But for failed PKs, you can always do endothelial keratoplasty. For failed PKs where there is anterior haze only, you can always do anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So that option is there. So if there is a graft which has already been done, uh, it's not necessary that you have to do a full thickness graft. Sometimes you have graft rejections, and when you have graft rejections, then you can always replace the endothelium because that is the thing which will go away. So, sir, would you like to uh, comment? I think that was a very nice publication. I think when you rightly you rightly pointed out. Uh, I think there are two groups of patients. One is a failed keratoplasty patients, and second is a failed uh, endothelial keratoplasty, and third is a failed uh, dark patients. So, if we looked into a uh, you know failed grass post uh, full thickness and post. Uh, DSEC cases mainly and look for a reasons for a failure because that will uh, decide what type of new procedure you're going to do in these cases. And in looking into DSEC failures, uh, mainly those are the cases divided into two groups. One was a primary donor failure or a donor did not function that well. In those cases, you could replace with the same surgery or you could shift to a DMEC in those cases because you do not have any anatomical uh, limitation in those cases. Second large group of patients where DSEC failed was having a large peripheral anterior sinica formation or a jipping of a iris into the that junction of a DSEC to the host area. Maybe because of a eccentric graft in it to begin with or a patient having a little uh, inflammatory or shallow chambers. So those cases we had to assess what surgery to be done in these cases. We, we thought like if patient has more than 180 degrees sinica in those cases, Despite you could release uh, DSEC lenticule from them, it was uh, bound to have a failure because we found that glaucoma was a major consideration in those cases. Almost 40% of the cases had a, a glaucoma, which is uncontrolled in these failed DSEC patients. In those cases, we opted for a full thickness graft as a primary choice in these cases, second surgery. Otherwise, where the sinica was less than 180 degree and glaucoma was under control, we did a, a DSEC or DMAC in these cases. That, that was a major consideration. I think that uh, study uh, looked into the what were the primary cause of failure in these cases and how would we change our approach for a second procedure in those cases. And what Dr. Namata described the entire presentation was full of uh, the book uh, she's going to come with again, corneal transplant surgery. But uh, to be very frank, uh, the lamellar procedures, the indications have totally shifted uh, from anterior to posterior. If you look into a, a decade back, in my time in 2000, early 2000, anterior laminar keratoplasty was 90% and few people were doing a you know, posterior laminar keratoplasty, mellies and other people. Now it's, things are reversed now, 10% is anterior and 90% are posterior. Mainly because uh, the keratoconus which came in, uh, in early 2000 as a major indication for a uh, anterior laminar keratoplasty, ALTK type procedure. And that has totally gone. Now, even doing a keratoplasty in keratoconus is going to be a, a dream in the future for younger people. <laughs> because you're going to prevent uh, you know, that uh, step coming in these cases. That's <laughs> the best part which has happened. Uh, all those learnings might be waste for... Uh, Teachers like, you know, oh. which have been, they are surviving on those facts of, you know, difficult surgery of doing a dark in those cases. But yes, uh, DMEC or endothelial transplant surgery would be there for some time. I'm pretty sure it will be replaced by the other procedure, which may be uh, just uh, simply desperate scoring or uh, some sort of, uh, you know, endothelial cell transplant surgery in those cases. So I think the surgery on cornea is going to be, you know, less for a, corneal disorders, it will be more for our refractive surgeon patients, especially for presbyopic uh, procedures. Quite right, sir. Completely yeah. agree with you. So, one more question in this uh, context. Uh, if you have a patient who has already undergone C3R, I think the dissection is more dicey. You know, it's uh, more difficult to separate the, <coughs> the lamellae. Uh, I think especially the anterior lamellae. So, any comments on that? Uh, Yes, sir, or ma'am. 
Uh, I think Namrata has done some cases there also. That's why we are concerned if you want to do a, you know, uh, dark in those cases, it's not difficult. Because uh, whatever uh, collagen which has become uh, more compact is an anterior part. And yeah. we're going to make uh, you know, bubble in a posterior part. Yeah. In fact, you have an easy uh, doing dark in these cases rather than having difficulties. So I, I, I would say it's not a big challenge for a people who have to do a dark in these cases. Namaste can comment more in this. But I think I agree with you completely. Big bubble dark is not a challenge. But if you try to do layer by layer, yeah. then it might become a little tricky situation because the resistance is much more. Yeah. And about silicon oil touching the back of the uh, transplant, because some of my patients actually, they are aphakic and they had a transplant and a retinal detachment. So oil is on the back and one patient particularly had a blast injury and we don't have a bed to re, uh, re-transplant because the, there's a lot of peripheral limbal issues. So can you comment on what would be the management such cases? I think there also, you know, uh, Gopal, you know, that, you know, silicon uh, use assess in a vitro-retina surgery has uh, decreased a lot. Uh, I, I used to do a lot of uh, cataract surgery post-silicon oil. Now, that has really come down because of uh, improvement in vitro-retina surgery. But the case you are trying to describe, if you have an aphakic patient with silicon in the anterior chamber, graft is bound to fail in these cases. I think there uh, we have to, if you want to make your graph survive for a longer time and glaucoma doesn't uh, get into a difficult situation, I think you have to create a barrier in these cases. So maybe I would look for a, some sort of a you know, pseudo uh, implant. If there's a support, it's okay. If there's no support, maybe I do a, some sort of a scleral fixation type procedure so that I have a you know, compartment and prevent silicon oil uh, getting onto the anterior chamber then do a, a second surgery for uh, replacing the, the failed uh, endothelium or endothelial graft in these cases. If you just do a graft in these cases, you're going to fail again and again. Thank you very much. Anil, uh, should we move to the next one? Yeah, we can, we can move on. The next speaker would be uh, Dr. Vinay. He'll be speaking on, uh, I think Vinay has already been introduced by Gopal. Uh, Vinay is very popular in Kerala as a, a corneal surgeon, senior corneal surgeon, and heads the uh, head uh, the Giridhara Institute, the cornea and refractive surgery services. And he has a special interest in uh, ocular surface disorders. Vinay would be talking on microbial keratitis. The, the topic would be titled Beat the Bus. Uh, thanks, Anil. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, hope I'm audible enough and not too low. Good you morning. You are audible. Yeah, good, good morning, everybody. So, uh, what exactly is microbial keratitis? It's nothing but infection of the cornea with bacteria, fungus, protozoa, or virus, which results in or can result in epithelial defect, there will be cellular infiltration and possibly stromal necrosis too. Probably we can, you know, call this as the definition of any, uh, any microbial keratitis. So what, what are we aiming to achieve when we see a case of microbial keratitis? The first aim is to get a clinical diagnosis, then to confirm it, and get a you know a, a, a true picture of what is a real causative agent, and then of course treat this condition. So any microbial keratitis, you start with the proper history, because history definitely gives a pointer towards a causative agent. Uh, look for you know proper other predisposing factors like theophylline dysfunction, abnormalities of the lid, other corneal abnormalities like exposure, neurotrophy, and so on. Then systemic problems then associated features like a contact lens pair, trauma, immunosuppression. A very important factor which I would like to stress here is proper documentation of the clinical findings, either with photo or detailed diagram if possible. I think with uh, you know EMR becoming very popular now, probably photograph would be a step above uh, um, you know, diagrammatic representation or uh, documentation. 
So uh, in a bacterial keratitis, you know, it can be either because of gram-positive organisms or gram-negative organisms. Some of the features which help us identify a gram-positive infection is a localized infiltrate, which is round, oval, gray, with quite distinct borders and minimal surrounding edema and AC reaction. While in gram-negative organism, it usually is fulminant infection, but severe separation, severe anterior chamber exudates, less defined infiltrate, and as I mentioned uh, before, a rapid progression with necrosis, excavation, and even perforation. So various organisms can present uh, in different ways. Uh, uh, some of the you know slowly progressive ones like uh, nocardia, mycobacteria, actinomyces, we should have a high degree of suspicion when you see clinically. A fungal infection can result from either filamentous fungi or yeast-like organisms, especially more common is a filamentous one. As a history of you know injury with the vegetative matter, an indiscriminate use of uh, drops like antibiotics and topical steroids would give us a pointer towards fungal origin. Clinical features, the you know the the age-old description of uh, symptoms much less than the signs is one uh, again pointed towards fungal infection. There can be defect, stromal infiltrate or abscess. Classically, the edges can have feathery finger-like extensions. There can be elevated lesions with rough or dry-looking base. Pigmentation almost always uh, indicate a, a fungal infection, especially dermatitis fungi. Uh, multiple satellite lesions, again, point towards a fungal infection, so on. Then we, you have the, you know, the not so common variety uh, of uh, infective keratitis, like the protosoval infections of acanthamoeba keratitis. Uh, the classic description of contact lens or, you know, water may not be there in many of the Indian patients, but most of them will have a history of some kind of corneal trauma. Again, uh, features of pain out of proportion, uh, to the signs, severe, you know, early, early infection can just look, mimic a, a viral and epithelial lesion uh, in a dendritic passion, pattern. And, uh, uh, extensive infection can even involve the sclera, uh, ring infiltrates, uh, radial keratoneuritis is a classic uh, description of uh, acathobaby keratitis. And all these features, again, you know, may uh, help us in making a clinical uh, diagnosis of acanthamoeba. Then uh, we have the mic microsporidis, which has come up uh, in a, been a big way now because of you know, our understanding and uh, identification or looking for this particular pathogen. More common is the epithelial keratitis variety, which is usually self-limiting and there is no need for any particular treatment other than supportive. And probably you can think of debriding the epithelium. But once it gains access to the stroma, it is practically a surgical uh, treatment option because none of the drugs known or available in India at, at present works in these cases. Then you have the I mean, viral uh, group of infections, adenoviral quite common, which presents with uh, either punctate erosions or stromal erosions, <laughs> sorry, stromal infiltrates. Then you have the herpes group of infection, dendrites, zoster will have a dermatomal in involvement stromal involvement uh, in both the cases. So, so uh, a proper history and, you know, a proper clinical examination with document will help us in arriving at some kind of clinical diagnosis first. The next step is to identify the real cause, whether we are correct in our clinical diagnosis. For this, we have to perform a proper laboratory procedures. So is microbiology really necessary in these cases? The answer is definitely yes. Corneal scraping is the first and the uh, you know, most important uh, aspect of investigation which needs to be done here. All of them should be scraped for uh, you know, KOH mount for, to identify fungal filaments and gram, which will help in the type of either positive or negative bacteria or even fungal filaments are stained in gram stain. At the same time, culture should be taken. Uh, the, May even the routine culture is taking blood agar, chocolate, and subros dex SD or subros dextrose agar. But can we not do scraping? Uh, probably yes, in very selected cases. You know, uh, if there is very low uh, reaction in the anterior chamber, small infiltrate, which is quite away from the center, you can probably, you know, start empirical treatment directly. But then these patients should have very close follow up 
and at the sign of uh, no response or um, you know uh, worsening it has to be scraped other than uh, corneal scraping uh, other techniques of uh, you know for bio uh, for diagnosis as corneal biopsy ac tap for uh, pcr and other uh, you know advanced tests and even confocal microscopy if you have access to it the next step is once is the treatment we uh, the aim of treatment in microbial keratitis is to eliminate the causative agent suppress the inflammatory response that occurs restore the normal structure and function and adjunctive treatment for other symptoms and for comfort so for uh, uh, the eliminating the agent we start the antimicrobial therapy um, initiate the therapy assess the patient some of them may need inpatient treatment uh, like one eye patients fulminant infections if the visual axis is threatened you know um, the certain perforation in it. and then of course poor compliance if you feel the patient is going to not comply with your advice you may have to admit the patient initiate uh, usually with with broad spectrum antibacterial therapy bacterial ulcers what is preferred is a fortified cephalosporin with an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinone or even if fortified uh, medications are not uh, not available or not possible to be made then a single agent with uh, fluoroquinone can be started for antifungals natamycin is the preferred drug of uh, drug at present and uh, polyconazole amphotericin and whole lot of other groups and drugs are available but still natamycin is the gold standard in our setup because the majority of fungal infection is with fungal uh, i mean sorry uh, filamentous fungi and natamycin has been shown to be much better than single or agent polyconazole roots topical at drops is the most common and most effective uh, uh, route there are a lot of other routes and depending upon the extent of uh, you know infiltrate and the response it can you know give the other forms like intrastromal intracamel systemic uh, therapy dosing initially very high frequency and uh, uh, systemic agents are preferred in when there is deep mycosis threatening of the limbus sliver involvement lack of response to topical or if there is suspected end of thalamitis assess the response in 2 to 3 days if the symptoms improve discharge is reduced the character of the infiltrate changes with well defined blunting or edges uh, stromal edema reduces reduction in anterior chamber inflammation all this means there is a um, uh, you know response to whatever we are giving continue the same medication if there is no response a worsening reassess if look in the isolate if it, there is no sensitive I mean, it is not sensitive change the antibiotic if it is sensitive drugs which is going on look for other causes like complex then decrease the frequency uh, and then reduce it to such a level that the you know the drug reaches four to six times a day and unlike steroids never ever uh, taper antimicrobial agents to less than you know, four times a day so total duration may take around 3 to 4 weeks to a few months as in cases of uh, acanthamoeba keratitis reepithelialization may be a sign of uh, you know a response but not always so we can uh, epithelialization can be delayed because of the toxicity of the medicines and so this has also to be kept in mind next is to suppress how do you suppress the inflammatory response the answer is steroids topical steroids but should it be given in all cases the answer is no in bacterial uh, you know ulcers where you know the bacterial serial drug has gone and there is a definite response probably you can use it to control the inflammation but it is absolutely contraindicated in impending perforation and fungal infections to restore the normal structure and function we may have to use to resort to surgical interventions and it may be required when there is no or lack of I mean, reduced response to medical therapy and some of the risk factors are old age delayed response patient or referral patients who have already used steroids and other uh, you know uh, medication large ulcers and so on so almost always precedes i mean um, i mean it is preceded by a course of uh, medical therapy except in very severe infection and perforation of certain perforation surgical therapy can be to facilitate diagnosis like scraping you know uh, knotted suture to the deep infiltrate biopsy 
is patch our synthesis of the anterior chamber to get access, I mean, access to aqueous for investigation. To support medical therapy, like a superficial keratectomy, especially in an ulcer with thick plaque, where it helps to reduce <clears throat> the organismal road load and aids in drug penetration. And in uh, uh, for tectonic support using thick tissue adhesives like cyanocalate glue. Definitive therapy, the most common performed one is therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. Other options like lamella, patch graft in all size of I mean, all sorts of shapes and size can be done based on the infiltrate and uh, uh, the you know condition of the eye. Hooding probably as an end, I mean you know uh, as an option when there is a lack of availability of tissue. And finally, in uh, when there is a, you know end of thalmitis to pan of thalmitis, we may have to think about evisceration. If there is scleral involvement, we may have to think about you know scleral or uh, limbal cryo debridement, large scleroconal grafting, or just a scleral grafting alone if there is localized scleral infections. Along with that, you may have to give it uh, you know to control the pain cycloplegics, analgesics. If there is a high IOP, uh, uh, drugs to reduce IOP, chemical cautery, mm -hmm, probably you know doubtful useful. I mean, used in the present modern era. Central tarsography can be used in a persistent defect once the infection is resolved to get the epithelium to heal. And to summarize, yes, in microbial keratitis, our first aim is to get a proper diagnosis from clinical and other laboratory investigations, and then start your medical therapy, assess the response to medical therapy, a quite significant number of these cases may end up with the various kinds of surgical intervention. So in all these cases, you should have a proper stepwise approach to get an ideal uh, result. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vinay. It was a very exhaustive talk. I know it's a, it's uh, something very different, difficult to cover the whole subject within uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, I think uh, I will uh, ask for some questions from the panel or uh, I didn't see any YouTube questions as of now. So Vinay, I may have missed it, but uh, do you have uh, multifocin uh, reused or do you know about, I mean, multifocin in a cantamoeba keratitis, it said that, you know, it works for a cantamoeba keratitis, but there were then some studies which were, you know, uh, saying that it doesn't. So what is your take on that? Uh, I have absolutely no idea, ma'am, because I've never used it. Mm. I have never had access to the drug at all. It is a pretty expensive drug and it costs a lot. That is the only problem. And then you don't have the prepared drops. You have to again make those drops. One, one aspect, you know, I would like you and uh, Shweta to comment on is the pythium keratitis. I mean, the new kid in the block. Again, I, you know. I think Shweta I, will be able to comment uh, on this because. My personal experience has been very limited, uh, mm -hmm. probably because of the, you know, the lack of uh, diagnosis uh, happening here, but then very limited experience with pythium. Shweta, will you like to comment on it? Yeah, actually, um, we've, I don't know whether we've been lucky or unlucky, but we've had uh, a few cases of pythium keratitis and uh, the sure shot for diagnosis would be uh, the PCR because uh, as and when, yes, uh, the, you know, the microbiologist at your center get accustomed to seeing it. They can very well suspect it. It could be highly suspicious where we say that the KOH stain uh, is suspicious of, um, uh, of Pythium, but the sure shot definitely would be a PCR. As far as uh, the treatment is concerned, there have been different experiences. Uh, we have not had great success with the medical therapy, and we still believe that early surgical intervention with or without uh, the supportive therapy will help. Uh, we recently published our experience with the uh, use of topical ethanol in OPD. So when you are sure that the patient has um, a pythium keratitis, we have tried uh, soaking the uh, swab that we get, you know, the buds that we usually use. We soak that in 99.9% .9 ethanol and place it on the eye after 
opening, you know, after good paracane uh, use, uh, using a speculum in the OPD on the chair itself, we asked the patient to be a little supine and place that swab, alcohol soak swab for almost 30 seconds and then repeat it again for 30 seconds and see how the response is. But then again, it's not full and final. We've been successful with some and not with some. So yeah, it is a difficult organism to treat and we are still looking for the, you know, for a better answer. What about lenozolid, uh, which was, uh, you know, known to be... Uh... Yeah, ma'am. So we've had, we've in fact combined lenozolid topical with topical uh, astromycin and oral, but we've not been very happy. In fact, we tried looking at the mechanism of action as well. So these being the antibiotics, they are supposed to act on your 60S and your 80S chromosome, which is present in the bacteria. But that chromosome is not seen in humans and the pythium, uh, the eukaryotic or the prokaryotic group that we talk about. So, you know, they are very classically seen in the bacterial organisms and not with pythium, uh, the ATS ribosome. So, which is why it is, they are more antibacterial. So, you know, the azithromycin and linozolid have always been known as antibacterial because of the mechanism of action. That same ribosomal structure does not exist in pythium. So, which is why how it really acts is something that we really don't know. And personally, we have not had great experience with it. So. Okay, so if there are no questions, then I think we can invite the next speaker, Dr. Anil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, one small question I have regarding uh, yeah. microbiology. I think uh, a lot of uh, corneal surgeons are limited by the availability of the microbiological support they get. You know? So I think in big centers, that is not a big problem. But uh, I think their success rates, I mean, the, the isolation rates are definitely more than 80%, 85% or so. But if you go to the, uh, if you give the sample to the local uh, labs, you get something like 10% or 15%. You know, so there's a huge difference in the, microbiological recovery that you see. So uh, uh, what can be done, we really don't know. You know I'm, I'm lucky that I have a person who has got an ocular microbiology training, but otherwise uh, I don't think a general microbiologist would be able to identify small uh, amount of bacteria or fungi in uh, our uh, these uh, specimens, which are quite minute for them. So that limits the treatment of microbial keratitis to a very significant extent. It does, and I think I would again like to quote a paper which was done by Dr. Tushar Agarwal in which he's, uh, you know, uh, very nicely showed that with the help of a magnifier and with the help of a, uh, a Zoom uh, uh, a smartphone, you can, if nothing, you can pick up the fungi and at least can know whether you can, uh, whether you should start your antifungal or not. But having said that, uh, it can never replace, you know, microbiology per se. And I think you do need, especially in recalcitrant cases, you do need the microbiological diagnosis. Maybe empirical, you can start with small ulcers, uh, less than three millimeters, not involving the visual axis. But for those which are large ulcers involving the visual axis, uh, their microbiology would be needed. And then again, recalcitrant ulcers. And if you are sitting in a tertiary eye care center, then more importantly in cases which have been treated at various places and you really don't know what the organism is. So you don't know what, where to start. I, I have a feeling microbial keratitis, you know, is something like mathematics. So you have to keep excluding and two plus two works out to be four, something like that. So, and you have to get over with one set of antimicrobials first, uh, rather than starting cocktail, because you should know what you're already over with, what's not working. So for instance, if a patient is of bacterial keratitis coming with the combination therapy, which he's already received and yet not healing. So first and foremost, you have to ensure that the patient has actually taken what he's saying. And secondly, you will have to then change because he's already over with combination therapy, not responding. Then think of, you know, some other either uh, antibacterial or some other agent, why the, the, the patient is not responding. And I think what we miss out most often is that Patient is already on a cocktail therapy and then if you try to take a scrape, then you will confuse the diagnosis. So best that for 24 hours, uh, you stop the uh, antimicrobials, uh, just put the patient on cycloplegics and then take a fresh scrape from there, which I know is again, very difficult. 
because you don't want to i mean it's it's uh, it's not so easy to stop all the antimicrobials but that is the way that it is being described Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. So there is a, uh, right now, intravitreal injections are becoming very, very common. It's actually uh, the number one procedures. It's basically going to replace cataract as, you know, each person requires multiple intravitreal injections. So after each injection, we give a lot of antibiotics, which is not called for, but for legal purposes, etc. We use a lot of antibiotics. And that actually changed the ocular flora a lot. So, Madam, uh, or TTL sir, or uh, Dr. Shweta, are you seeing a lot of uh, these uh, changed microbiological flora uh, leading to more virulent infections in the cornea? So I think uh, it is not so much about virulent infections, but more about resistance, which would be there because you are using uh, this for prophylaxis, and resistance is uh, one thing you know which is very difficult to treat, especially with antibacterials. We, the moment a new drug comes, everybody jumps on it, you know, and gives it for all kinds of situations. So that is the thing which causes, uh, and just a couple of years down the line or two to three years, you start developing resistance to it. So I think that is a very major issue with intravitreal injections, like you're saying that antibiotics uh, are, uh, uh, you know, given. So that is one thing that can occur. And second thing is that you're giving intravitreal injections. I'm not saying that you would be causing endothelmitis when you give them. But what I am saying is that, you know, there is every possibility theoretically that when you are giving intravitreal injections, there may be some infection. And so you may have, again, the, the territory which is completely uncharted is keratitis with endothelmitis. You hardly have any publications on that or hardly have any uh, people managing simultaneously where we would require you also, Gopal, and us also. So it is like that because... Whenever you have a corneal abscess, the, the retina surgeons are going to say, we can't see anything. First you treat this and then only we are, you know, going to do whatever we are going to do. So I think that is some issue that needs to be sorted out. But fulminant infections as such after intravitreal... No, uh, no, it is not about fulminants. It's about the resistance. So uh, yeah. now moxifloxin is said to be about 40% resistant right now. I mean, the mm -hmm. ocular flora are resistant to moxifloxin significantly. significantly. That is a problem that would yeah. come in. So that is definitely coming in. Even post-cataract surgery, people give antibiotics for a month or so <laughs> happily. One, one, so and more, one more thing is you should not never taper antibiotics. Antibiotics should not be tapered because you are allowing resistance to happen. They have to be just, you know, stop short. Unlike topical steroids or even lubricants which you... Uh, Dr. Kopal, uh, one small question to you. What is the duration of your uh, post-injection antibiotics? Actually, uh, most of the places like Shankar Netralaya is not using antibiotics. Uh, Elvi Prasad is not using antibiotics. But you see, one in 10,000 risk of endophthalmitis is there. And if it goes to court, then the judge will ask why you did not put antibiotics. Yeah. That is a legal defensive standpoint why we are using antibiotics. And we can use it uh, for about a week or so. That's all. Uh, that that is not required. Most of the uh, developed countries are not at all using. Can we, uh, also, uh, for the from the legal point uh, point of view, also can we say that we are not supposed to use antibiotics like this because we are, uh, I mean, uh, causing resistance. That's also a point the judge should consider. Yeah, I think the Corneal Society of India has to come <laughs> out with a, a, a white paper on that. Uh, it's an excellent platform to <laughs> both uh, the Iskras and the Cornea Society of India can come out with a white paper on that. Dr. Tityal, sir, would you like to comment on this? Um, AOS can do it, ma'am, under your guidance. Yeah, yeah, was... <laughs> Tityal, sir, is. Uh... I think he is uh, off, so we can move to the next. Uh... Uh, one more, uh, just a small comment I would like to make in this setting, because uh, I think uh, more than the ophthalmologists, the, the drug company people, they give it to all MBBS, even Ayurvedic practitioners. So everyone very happily uses uh, moxifloxacin. Yeah. And that is the one of the major causes. I think a bigger cause would be the use in uh, veterinary industry. Uh, they feed uh, broiler chicken with antibiotics so that they become obese and uh, mm -hmm. are resistant to infection. 
and they are used they called uh, quite uh, early also so, even the river water that, that forms the major amount of antibiotic resistance even in the developed world so unless we control that there's no point in uh, doctors reducing the prescriptions quite right Yeah, our next speaker is Dr. Sujit Nayanar. He's again uh, very famous in Kerala, especially he covers almost uh, most of uh, North Kerala. Uh, he had his uh, training from RP Center and has worked with uh, a lot of uh, our familiar faculty here. Uh, he has done his fellowship in uh, Miami for the ocular surface and I think under the late fellowship, short fellowship uh, a few years ago, again in Baskin Palmer. And uh, he has been practicing coronary interfractive surgery, uh, various types of lamellar surgeries, uh, and uh, even presbyopic LASIK and all that. So welcome, Sujit. Uh, uh, can you share your slide now? I hope it's visible, so, sir. So. Audible? Yes. Yes, yes. A very good morning. And uh, let me, at the outset, let me thank uh, Kuchin of Talmik Club for giving me this opportunity. Also, I thank uh, Namrata Madam and Dr. Anil uh, for inviting me to be part of this um, August gathering. I mean, a faculty, list of faculty. It's an honor for me. The topic given to me is uh, the treating the bulbs. Management uh, of corneal ectasia. So I was told that uh, the the majority of uh, audience will be a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Uh, so I would uh, like to begin with. I would like to draw the attention to this paper, which came up uh, maybe around five six years back. Global consensus on the keratoconus and ectatic diseases, which clearly defines and uh, uh, clarifies the various terminologies that is being used for uh, the ectatic. Others. The point which I wanted to stress is what is an ectatic disorder or what is a primary corneal ectasia. So they have clearly told that there are, these are the four diseases that is the keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, keratoglobus, and post refractive surgery. Progressive corneal ectasia should be classified under the ectatic disorders, and other conditions like the inflammatory males, the terians, and all comes under the thinning disorders. So uh, that is one differentiation that uh, everyone should make. So in our scenario and almost in this topic, I'll be covering only the keratoconus, which is by, by far the most common thing that we deal with. And uh, uh, in an, a nutshell to an approach to the ectasia would be like, first of all, you have to diagnose the ectasia with the available criteria that is uh, available in literature from the topography or tomographic uh, criteria. Then uh, you have to monitor the progression. You have to plan cross-linking to stop the progression if it indicated. In the meanwhile, you have to prevent the complications like eye drops or perforation. Use appropriate methods or uh, of uh, visual rehabilitation, and uh, probably in many cases you have to uh, use a combination of uh, methods, uh, surgical or laser uh, laser uh, methods, to be uh, used to uh, treat the patient and give him a proper visual rehabilitation and do a regular follow for a longer period. So this was one landmark paper that came up in uh, 2003, early 2000s, uh, after a series of experimental and animal studies, uh, they have, the um, group came up with this revolutionary treatment uh, that changed uh, the way we approach a corneal ectasia, the riboflavin ultraviolet A rays uh, induced collagen cross-linking for the treatment of keratoconus. Things have changed a lot in the last 17 to 20 years. Uh, better understanding of the procedure have come up. Indications have expanded, the contraindications have been relaxed, and it's almost like a, a gold standard procedure for the early management of corneal ectasia. So in the paper which I mentioned, the global uh, consensus, it has mentioned that almost 83% of non-cornea trained physicians uh, are doing corneal collagen cross-link. So all the more important that I focus on this particular aspect rather than going into the, all the uh, management details of the corneal ectasia. 
So the, in this paper, the inclusion criteria for the procedure was a diagnosis of keratoconus that was confirmed on the topography and slit lamp, documented progression, a minimum pachymetry of 400 microns, that's after the removal of the epithelium, with an age range uh, in that particular study was 13 to 58, average age was 31 years, with a moderate to advanced keratoconus and a range of keratometry value 48 to 72 diameter. Protocol that was followed in that was uh, the resident for a protocol, the standard conventional uh, protocol of uh, collagen cross-linking, in which the epithelium was removed for seven millimeter diameter, uh, a point uh, one ribof percent riboflavin in twenty percent dextrin uh, was used uh, as photosensitizer uh, for soaking the cornea for thirty minutes, followed by thirty minutes of ultraviolet ray, th a three seventy nanometer wavelength with an irradiance of three millivolts per centimeter square, and which provide which of gives an effective dose of 5.4 joules per centimeter square. So uh, it is a complex uh, uh, photochemical reaction that is going on, uh, which includes uh, an aerobic phase as well as an anaerobic phase, uh, in which the riboflavin acts as a photosensitizer, but other than the photosensitizer, it has got two more roles. It actually acts as a protective bed for the uh, protecting against the bad effects of the ultraviolet A rays on the deeper structures like the lens and the um, deeper structures. And it also supposed to give a cooling effect uh, on the corneal surface. In the aerobic, as part of this aerobic and an anaerobic phase, um, the photochemical process that is going on, oxygen radicals are formed and which helps in uh, singlet oxygen radicals, which active radicals form, which helps in covalent cross-linking of corneal collagens. So uh, it was uh, clearly uh, demonstrated by uh, by uh, Wallensek et al. that there is stiffening of the cornea post cross-linking, which is uh, shown by uh, the Young's module, which indirectly shows the stiffening of the cornea. And the values uh, clearly mentioned that uh, there is uh, stiffening that's happening post cross-link. What are the ob uh, observed biological effects? One is like uh, you can see the cross-linking is mainly confined to the anterior two-thirds, like around anterior 242 microns of the cornea, the next 100 microns being the intermediate zone. And uh, the cross-linking results in the increased diameter of the cross-linked type 1 collagen fibers, uh, intrafibrillary cross-linking, as well as there is some doubts about the interfibrillary cross-linking also. The clinical effects that you see is around, uh, um, then the success rate is around 93 percentage of cases with improved uh, uncorrected and discorrected vision, uh, proportional to the topographic changes that is induced by the cross-linking. Almost two diopters change in the K-max was reported. The thinning of the cornea, which starts at the commencement of the procedure and continues up to the uh, one to three months following treatment. And some cases have been reported where the thinning uh, continues for a longer period. Uh, there is uh, no effect uh, has been demonstrated on the limbal stem cells or the cheerfilling or the corneal sense or the endothelial cells. Corneal sensitivity was uh, fully restored within a short period of time. So uh, seeing the initial uh, success rates, the extent, uh, the indications have been extended to other ectasias also like uh, PMD, as we already mentioned, the post-laser uh, refractive surgery ectasias and in combined with treatment protocols for the laser refractive surgeries in uh, borderline cases. And also in non-ectatic indications also like the corneal infections and the painful PBK for the symptomatic relief. So uh, the, 93, the success rate was um, shown as 93%. So we already have around 7% uh, failure rate, which was uh, came as a paper in 2009 from the from uh, Theo Seeler himself, which uh, clearly showed that the um, preoperative vision of more than 2025 was identified as a, as a significant risk factor for complication, probably because of the haze that is induced uh, and a higher uh, preoperative keratometry also, along with the higher age group, showed an uh, increased rate of failure. Apart from the failure, there is something which we uh, fear about is a complication because uh, already it's a um, compromised eye and we don't want to create more problems in that eye. The complication is defined as losing two or more Snellen lines uh, post-procedure and it's around 2.9% uh, for this procedure, which uh, includes a very... Um, uh, benign uh, complication like a sterile infiltrate to a very uh, threatening, uh, vision threatening infectious keratitis. It can uh, also have persistent uh, stromal haze, corneal edema and endothelial burn, all um, uh, secondary to the endothelial damage that is happening. 
and as we are using it more and more we are also finding uh, we are trying to push it into more uh, indications uh, to cover the more indications we are having some challenges also because we are unable to treat because of the fear of the endothelial damage we are unable to treat the thinner corneas uh, of that is uh, seen in uh, most of the advanced keratocone and also some uh, confusions in the pediatric population which i am not touching upon so uh, depending upon the uh, challenging conditions the factors that has been modified in various protocols are the concentration of the riboflavin that is being used the penetration to increase the penetration of the riboflavin through the intact epithelium the thickness of the cornea like how how you can modify the thickness by uh, swelling up the cornea or using a contact lens uh, while uh, during the procedure and also uh, changing the uv fluence so various modified protocols have come up over the years uh, which uh, i've just um, enumerated here uh, the epithelial on or trans epithelial cross linking uh, was considered to be uh, used for the thinner corneas where you don't want to lose the thickness of the epithelium and that um, had to be a little more protective by getting around 50 to 60 extra microns of thickness and it also uh, gives a better uh, pain relief or a painless uh, um, post operative pain then uh, the accelerated cross linking was introduced with a higher irradiation with a shorter duration of time so that your uh, expose your uh, bare stroma is not exposed to the um, uh, environment for a longer time pulsed uh, cross linking for intermediate cooling of the co corneal tissues chemical enhancers to, the, uh, to increase the riboflavin penetration uh, interferences uh, cross linking again for the better riboflavin delivery and uh, uh, the certain uh, cross linking procedures were linked with the prk or a topo guided prk for a refractive correction also which we'll come up with the uh, next few slides so coming to the accelerated protocol uh, the accelerated cross linking was uh, proposed on the basis of the bunsen rosco law of reciprocity in which it shows that the power uh, the ultraviolet a rays power uh, can be adjusted with the delivery time so that the, uh, a constant energy of 5.4 joules can be delivered without giving the entire 30 minutes the so various protocol that was used in the various parts were like for the 10 minutes 5 minutes 6 minutes 3 minutes and 2 minutes and accordingly the power was varied um, in each protocol there was a question about uh, whether these accelerated protocols give the same efficacy as the standard protocol recently in 2020 and uh, meta analysis of the rct uh, on this particular subject came up which uh, shows that that uh, there is only two small concern that is the standard uh, cross linking gives a slightly better better corrected vision but the uncorrected vision is almost same for the both the techniques and also the accelerated cross linking shows a shallower demarcation line otherwise most of the characters like the decrease in the cct uh, the uh, i mean the safety factors like the endothelial cell damage safety etc was uh, comparable between two groups so how do you the, this is the one of the most uh, challenging condition because we want to cross link more and more uh, keratoconus and we uh, end up uh, seeing keratoconus less than 400 microns more often uh, these days uh, and we have kept a 400 microns after uh, removal of the epithelium as a uh, um, benchmark uh, criteria. So uh, uh, there was one uh, attempt to increase the corneal thickness with a soaking of uh, the cornea with uh, saline or uh, hypoosmolar, using also hypoosmolar uh, riboflavin. But it showed, the papers shows that there is poor predictability of the corneal swelling, that the swelling between uh, each cornea or the different corneas actually varies and you cannot uh, standardize that uh, the cornea will swell this much in this much, uh, uh, this many minutes or something like that. So uh, that is not, that is still being utilized, but not very standardized. Cross-linking uh, with uh, contact lens assistance was tried uh, from a paper from uh, India was, uh, by Susan Jacob was there. In the Journal of Refractive Surgery, but again, it later showed that because of the contact lens usage, the cornea is deprived of the oxygen, and there is uh, almost thirty percent less effectiveness of this type of cross. -linking. And also, the customized epithelial deprivement uh, with uh, a selective uh, epithelial island uh, removal was also tried. Again, the problem here was a poor predictability that uh, we don't know how it is going to affect the uh, uh, penetration of the riboflavin. 
This is one uh, new thing that has come up in the recent times by Havesi Ital, who is doing a lot of work on the um, corneal collagen cross-linking, the sub-400 protocol, called the individualized cross-linking. In this, what they have done is, uh, after removal of the epithelium, you, uh, you do the um, pachymetry on table and see how much it is. And based on that, they have put in a table uh, like if you're, I'll show it in the next slide, your um, pachymetry is so and so, the amount of energy, uh, amount of power you have to use is this much for this many minutes. So you just need to uh, check your CCT on table and check the table, uh, or the table provided in the paper and go accordingly. That is what they are um, proposing and which ultimately gives a safe uh, demarcation line that is almost 70 microns above the dismet membrane so, you're, so that your endothelium is still full. And this is the table. Like in this, they have gone up to a minimum stromal thickness of 200 microns. So even with 200 microns, you can radiate the cornea with, uh, uh, this is the uh, UV radiation duration uh, uh, that is being given uh, for how many minutes you have to do it. So it is different from what you know as a customized cross-linking, which is available for a few years uh, before that. So what in customized cross-linking, what you are doing is a cone-centered approach rather than you are, you are uh, cross-linking the entire cornea or the um, uh, larger area of eight to seven to eight millimeters. You are applying various powers at the uh, various parts of the so the center part of the cone is uh, given more um, power, followed by an intermediate zone, followed by a peripheral zone. So it's a, like a tailor-made approach where the center of the cone is being treated much. So it's a various, uh, this is uh, done or uh, this is uh, determined with the help of a, a topo guided, uh, either using the curvature map, various techniques have been described curvature, using the curvature map, pachymetry maps, or the maximum on the posterior float. So the initial results of the customized cross-linking are encouraging. The reasonable normalization of the anterior refractive surface is uh, uh, being reported with a good stability for more than one, one and a half years. Inferior superior asymmetry has been uh, reduced. There is flattening of the K-max. Improved BCBA is being reported, uh, reported without much endothelial compromise or extra haze. So uh, apart from the, uh, um, when you think of correcting the cone, you also uh, want, uh, you not only the depressing the cone, you think of also centralizing the cone. So that is otherwise known as the normalizing the anterior surface of the cornea, which helps in a better refractive surface so that you can at least, you're not uh, thinking or planning of a complete refractive solution, but you can at least give a better refractive correct post procedure. So this is one of my own case in which intrastromal corneal rings intact was done along with C yeah, two years back, so almost five years now. Uh, so this was the pre-op vision of five by sixty with uh, five uh, minus five spherical and uh, minus three cylinder. At eighteen months uh, post-op, now you can see that uh, vision has improved considerably, and uh, so that he can have uh, he's actually having a very uh, small uh, refractive error with minus one to minus one point five, and he normally don't use glasses because of that. And uh, the um, the Refractive uh, wise, also it is uh, very uh, stable. The topography wise, also it is uh, stable, and you can see that uh, the uh, cone has been well centered and normalized. So, uh, the papers also initially there was a confusion whether you have to do it a concurrent or sequential, but uh, the uh, RCT has shown that concurrent gives good results in uh, combining these procedures. The only thing is that you have to select the cases properly, look at the um, pre op uh, corneal thickness at the pair. Uh, Periphery, not the periphery, mid periphery area, so that you have at least 120 to 140 uh, posterior thickness uh, after the uh, below the ring segment. So, uh, also, uh, the, the another group from uh, the John Kenlopolis, who is very active in uh, treating this uh, cross link, keratoconus um, with cross linking. As, uh, had come up with this Athens protocol a while ago that was cross linking with the topo guided PRK. So we have al always considered laser refractive surgeries as a taboo for uh, a keratoconus or an ectasia patient, but uh, they have shown it that a partial tomography guided, topography guided normalization of surface ablation along with the cross linking has given good uh, results uh, both in improving the vision, uh, reshaping the irregular corneal surface, stabilizing the ectasia without causing much. Uh, extra uh, uh, complications or problems for the uh, 
uh, in the long term. Ethan protocols is like uh, the, the excimer laser epithelial deprivement of about uh, 50 microns, followed by a partial topography guided excimer laser stromal ablation, followed by a high fluence uh, ultraviolet uh, cross linking uh, for 10, 10 millivolts for uh, 10 minutes. This is the protocol. And similar study has been uh, put out in uh, the paper had come up from the Rohit Shetty et al. Uh, in uh, IGO, which includes uh, inner pachymetry. They have put as uh, more than 450 microns as a criteria. And uh, so uh, nowadays the things are going more for a refractive cross-linking because we know the cross-linking is giving some refractive uh, improvement you are getting some refractive changes what what is being done to, uh, these days is to standardize that so that you can this refractive changes post cross-linking can be more predictable so that 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 itself can be used as a treatment the kxl2 offers a better uh, platform for this with the uh, pupil, uh, pupillary intraoperative tracking system delivery of a variable, variable pattern variable customized energy so the customized cross-linking is uh, coming up in a better and better way. So uh, the Canalopolis team has come up with the enhanced Athens protocol in which uh, they have uh, combined this topography, uh, topo guided PRK along with the customized uh, cross-linking where uh, the cross-linking is uh, only on, the, on uh, mainly focused on the cone and variable cross-linking over the surrounding areas. So uh, the visual rehabilitation of, uh, options uh, in such ectasia cases after cross-linking is definitely glasses, contact lens, specialized contact lens are all are there. But the options are coming up like this, uh, um, the Athens protocol or the enhanced Athens protocol, the corneal rings with the concurrent uh, CXL, the stromal implantation of the cross-linked lenticles, which I, haven't, I didn't touch upon, phakic IOLs uh, um, post-surface um, normalization with customized cross-linking. And lamellar surgical options as the last resort that it has been exhaustively covered by Anamrita Madden. And many options are yet to be validated with the long term visit. So, to summarize, the cross linking remains the mainstay of uh, treating ectasia. The newer combined protocols are giving more hope in adding refractive collection to the ability. Long term results need to be reviewed. Uh, having multiple therapeutic options in the armamentarium is the need of the hour. Wise decisions have to be taken on a case to case basis. But and then the ultimate aim is not to do more harm to the patient who is already having a compromised cornea. Thank you for uh, very much for this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sujit, for that exhaustive talk. I think you covered the aspects of uh, cross-linking pretty well, uh, as promised. I think we had a speaker on Conalectasia who backed out, and uh, he Sujit was supposed to deal with only cross-linking. I think it was being covered extensively well. Any questions? Excellent, excellent talk, Sujit. Covered everything. If somebody listens to this one talk, he would know everything about cross-linking. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity. I just have one question, Sujit, that people talk about customized cross-linking where they're just cross-linking the cone. But do you believe that just that focal cross-linking of the cone will you know, not cause ectasia to occur in future? Or uh, Because I believe that uh, keratoconus is not a local disease. It's like a global disease. Even after you do graft, you have post-PK ectasia, you have post-dalk ectasia. So those kind of problems are there. So uh, what would be your take on customized cross-linking just of the cone and leaving the rest of it like this only? Yes, ma'am, I, I agree with you. I am also not very, uh, I myself uh, actually didn't do customized cross-linking. I've done few uh, uh, PRK with cross-linking few years back, but somehow I changed the workplace and I lost the follow-up. But customized cross-linking is something as you told, I also believe that um, or whatever we have all learned is like keratoconus is more generalized uh, disease, not like just the cone is being uh, treated. But the reports coming up from the Canalopolis team is more than 1,000 eyes and also uh, probably, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not experienced to comment on that. But uh, again, this is uh, something, a new concept that is coming up uh, and we have to look into the long-term results. Any other question? Otherwise, we can move to the... I know that uh, the thesis was done by Dr. Tityal sir on topo guided uh, cross linking uh, followed by PRK. I don't know if he's there and if he can. 
comment on that but uh, i think as of now it, uh, these are the things which are really in gray zone and although customized cross linking has been done but not been done you know not reproducibly been done by several groups or uh, there are not it's only just one group or maybe just two groups who are uh, doing this so we really have to take the results uh, you know with a pinch of salt uh, if uh, the gasser is there i would like to have uh, asked him like uh, what was the how that uh, centration was done in that particular study based on the which map they had i said is top yeah anyway so if there are no questions then we can we move to the next one or would you want to ask something okay so the next one is vinay uh, can you introduce uh, dr uh, anil yes, radha yes yes yeah, i think it has already been introduced yeah. yeah great pleasure to introduce anil or rather it is he has already been introduced by um, you know uh, gopal but then he is a very good friend and as a professor in uh, amrita institute heads the cornea there uh, and so i don't know somehow we lost vina in between okay so anil can you yeah, give yeah, a yeah. talk on uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis Yeah, is it uh, visible? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis. I thank uh, Dr. Namrata, ma'am, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I think it's a topic which is uh, quite uh, close to my heart. So, I thank her. So, this is a condition which causes destruction of the peripheral cornea associated with severe inflammation. As you see, uh, there is a overhanging edge, and usually this. uh the condition is associated with an autoimmune disease and it usually proceeds circumferentially it's not impossible that it uh, it can move uh, centripetally it's not it, it, it can invade the center but generally it uh, proceeds in a circumferential fashion and there is always a overhanging edge if you take a needle or something underneath this you can uh, see that there is space because the cornea has really melted out so you should understand that puk is a killer disease and in almost up to 50% it can be the first manifestation of a serious vasculitis so why do we have that i think the nature of peripheral cornea has already been discussed by the previous speakers uh, the i am not talking about the morphology of the cells or the thickness of the cornea but we know that in the periphery of the cornea the uh, the cellular profile is different the presence of antigen presenting cells alters it and one main reason for that is this marginal vascular corneal arcades that is seen and uh, these are this is indigo sinin angiography of the anterior segment in which you see this limbal uh, microvasculature and wherever these loops are there the immune complexes have a predisposition to get deposited and once the immune complexes get deposited the uh, the trigger for autoimmune process happen you know that it activates the complement system cytokines are released proteases come and causes the corneal melt it's in a autoimmune disease if you look at it uh, there are autoantigens against which uh, the b cells produce the antibodies and this causes the antigen antibody reaction complement action complement fixation and cytokine release the other factor is interleukin 6 is also activated which stimulates the T cells to cause more interleukin 17, which is more important in the corneal aspect. So interleukin 17 is uh, uh, produces matrix metal proteinases, and that causes corneal melt. So these two factors uh, work. Uh, even though we intuitively believe that in autoimmune disease it's the uh, B cell disease. Uh, peripheral corneal disease can be a micro ulcerative peripheral keratitis or a macro ulcerative one micro ulcerative is the one which is usually attributed to staphylococcal marginal keratitis it is it is also involving um, uh, this immune complex deposits but that is a very minor thing it's more of a nuisance than a real big problem 
unless it becomes secondly infected. But macroulcerative keratitis is a, a different game altogether. This and necrotic scleritis denotes a very severe form of vasculitis. And if you don't treat such patients in time, not only the eye, the patient also may be lost. More than 50% of the people will die within 10 years. And if it's treated, the, uh, most of them can be basically taken care of. So on evaluation, Morens and PUK looks the same. And there is no, even though multiple theses have been uh, written, there is nothing really to suggest the differences between uh, Morens and PUK. So it's important that you have pay attention to the systemic evaluation of the patient to look for other connective tissue disorders. And as Dr. Vishal Janji was mentioning, we have to look at the inflammatory markers. The basic collagen profile has to be looked, ESR, CRP, NA, RA, and if possible, ANCA also. So in the eye, you look around uh, the eye. If you have PUK in other eye, you look at the fellow eye and look for any evidence of PUK or necrotis and scleritis or any evidence of corneal or uh, still thinning in the other eye. More common thing is the dry eye that is seen. In any auto-inflammatory disease, we see a dry eye is one of the commonest manifestations of an autoimmune disease, secondary Sjogren's. So if you see uh, punctate erosions, which are uh, coalescent, you know that there's a severe form of dry eye and this uh, person is very likely to have a autoimmune disease. We also need to a look at the uh, sclera. Sometimes this, this can be confused for pigmentation. You have to make the patient look up and see whether there is corneal thinning, the scleral thinning. If you can see the choroidal show like this, you can, you can be pretty convinced that you're dealing with an autoimmune condition. A sclerosing keratitis is also another indicator of a, a disease which has been pre-existing. So the principle of PUK management would be the treatment of the underlying disease. I think the treatment has to be taken with in conjunction with a rheumatologist or an internal medicine person. And we have to immunosuppress these patients depending on the nature of injury that you have. But most likely systemic steroids should work, but if there's an impending perforation or a necrotizing scleritis in a, a patient with the vaginus, uh, probably it's better to give IV methylprednisolone uh, and other uh, cyclophosphamide and other agents. Regarding the eye, we have to treat the uh, dryness aspect we have to support the eye as much as possible. You give liberal preservative free lubricants uh, and we can put in lacrimal plug also to preserve whatever uh, secretions we have. It's very important that we avoid usage of NSAIDs. Quite often, whenever you see something yellow in the eye, uh, we are scared to start steroids and you put NSAID and that can really promote uh, corneal melt. So also most of these antibiotics are pretty epithelial toxic. Even if you're using an antibiotic, you have to use something which is friendly to the epithelium like chloramphenicol. Uh, the other aspect of what we can deal is the suppression of the ulceration and the tectonic support that we can give. As I said before, we can prevent these immune complexes and the autoantigens from reaching the peripheral cornea. And if you do a peritomy and uh, plug the gap, bridge it with a cyanoclate glue, the chances of that disease process pro uh, proceeding would be less. And in cases in whom uh, this is not possible, you have to think of a tectonic keratoplasty. So Morens and PUK are similar uh, in the morphology. The only difference is that in Morens, it's the cornea associated antigen that is uh, there. In Morens, when I say Morens, uh, there are two categories that are recognized. One is the Morens that happens in the older population, which usually settles down with uh, topical steroids alone. While in Morens in young, usually, uh, goes on to have a very aggressive course and has to be thoroughly investigated. Uh, coming and regarding the treatment of Morens bar BUK, Morens is a local disease. So basically local treatment takes precedence. You give topical steroids. The second step would be peritomy plus glue, then systemic steroids, and then go for systemic immunosuppression. While in PUK, systemic immunosuppression takes the precedence and uh, other things are secondary. But I think uh, this binary that uh, one is systemic and other is local may not always be there. I think auto, uh, this rheumatology field has also progressed a lot within the last uh, 20, 25 years. I think uh, about 25 years, a survival rate of a patient who's diagnosed with vaginus, that is uh, vaginus granulomatosis was six months. And now it is uh, very good. You know, It's almost 90% of them um, reach 60 years or more than that. So it is a massive change has occurred in the 
a lifespan and the quality of life of patients with uh, these conditions. So we have these uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disorders, which are not really categorized. Then there can be mixed connective tissue disorders. And there is a big category, which is called the disease in evolution. A lot of these diseases in which you see, there are no inflammatory markers, sorry. There are no specific markers. They may in the long term, after five or 10 years, can throw up uh, having these markers. So this is a patient who had a who had uh, was thoroughly investigated and was under treated and went on to have a massive destruction of the cornea. Uh, this I've covered. So the management of uh, PUK basically is treatment of the underlying disease with systemic immunosuppression. So in the initial period, obviously you have to have a QK effect for which you have to use steroids, systemic steroids, or in uh, very threatening situations you have to use IV methylprednisolone and uh, cyclophosphamide. Other steroid sparing agents can also be used uh, as you been off the steroids as soon as possible because these people would require it in the long term. And so steroids have to be tapered and stopped or at least minimized as much as, much and as early as possible. The steroid sparing agents, which are normally used are methotrexate, acetyoprene, and in our context, mycophenolate dimorphotene. Um, and in people who are not responding, and then uh, we can use biological agents. There are multiple biological agents available now. Things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. Rituximab uh, and Adalibumab are uh, the most frequent ones that are still used. I'll just go with uh, two uh, short histories of two patients. This is a 46-year-old uh, auto rickshaw driver with no comorbidities who came with 6 by 12 vision. He had a uh, he came with pain, redness, and uh, watering from the eyes. He had a peripheral ulceration, which fitted really into the uh, PUK picture. So we did the basic collagen workup. Everything was normal, essentially normal, except that the CRP was borderline high. Uh, we gave steroids. There was some response to topical steroids, but the central uh, portion had the necrotic tissue. So because it's the young morans, I thought we'll give systemic steroids and systemic steroids was, there was an initial response after the systemic steroids, but that central area, the necrosis started progressing. When I, there was a, a suspicion of a secondary infection or was it a primary uh, corneal melt? Did the corneal scraping send it for microbiology and in the same sitting, peritomy and tissue adhesive application was done. That is basically peritomy you do, uh, the area of the infiltrate and about one millimeter on both sides is removed and uh, it is receded also. And that uh, conjunctiva is actually peritomy and it is cut out actually, because we don't want that, uh, that cells and the inflammatory cytokines to reach there. And then you bridge the gap with the tissue adhesive and then put in a bandage contact lens. This patient was given uh, predestate, CMC and doxycycline. And uh, he had resolution of the condition. And, uh, but four months later, he had res complete resolution of the situation after about one month or so when the glue became loose, we removed it. So four months later, he came up with a similar activity. He had a, a, a limbal congestion and an infiltrate over there. Started on uh, systemic visalon. There was reduction in the redness, but again, the infiltrate reappeared. A repeat conjunctival resection with TABCL was done. He was also started on a TAB methotrexate. As you see, there is a, a definite decrease in the amount of congestion and inflammation, but the, uh, the corneal delin is definitely present. He advised a tectonic support in the form of a multi-layered amniotic membrane, but he was not willing to get operated. But uh, nature uh, cured him it for him by forming a pseudoterygium there. Even though the cornea is thin, he is pretty okay. So he has come, he at the three year follow up, he had 69 vision. He was always maintained on just one 7.5 milligram, one tablet of uh, methotrexate. And he never had any problem in the next three years. This is another patient uh, who had uh, a, a vaginous granulomatosis. I think a more appropriate term would be granulomatous polyangiitis, which is the ideal term which is to use now. This is a well-known case. He had, she had uh, bilateral CSOM. She had a saddle nose. She had C and high positivity treated in multiple centers. And uh, she had issues in multiple areas. She had the cavity lesions in the chest, in the sinuses, and had some renal issues also. 
she was treated with six pulses of cyclophosphamide and steroids and he had optic neuropathy while on treatment. And when she presented, uh, I think uh, Gopal saw him initially and mostly it was managed by Gopal. Uh, she presented with necrotic scleritis in both eyes and PUK. So this eye with uh, PUK alone had uh, no PL because of the optic neuropathy that she had in the previous uh, relapse she had. While this eye, she had uh, necrotic scleritis, PUK was there and also oh, there was some anti as well. So this, there was a granulomatous mass in the orbital apex, which basically showed a uh, cost optic neuropathy and uh, basically made her lose her vision in that time. So this is a patient who's on maximal dose of steroids, azoran and mycophenolate, maximum maintenance dose, still had a disease relapse. So the patient by the rheumatologist was put on indication rituximab and uh, there was a dramatic response to the treatment, like uh, the vision improved and uh, all the congestion inflammation vanished within uh, two months. This girl has completed uh, 15 years of follow-up now. She still maintains six by six vision. So the point I wanted to stress is biologicals can make a huge difference in the life of these patients. And it's very important that you uh, use this treatment early in the disease process. So it's autoimmune disease is like a uh, something on fire, you know, if the earlier you douse the fire, the better would be the results. And if there is no, uh, and if there is a, if this patient, if this is a patient who had a, a multiple uh, corneal uh, perforation, she didn't have perforation, but multiple areas of thinning and had a leaky bleb. In such cases, you can do a patch graft for tectonic support. I'm not going to the full extent in the interest of time. So try to reduce the amount of full thickness graph that you do. And uh, this is the patch graph, completed patch graph. You can see that it does not look very nice, uh, even though it's required for the tectonic support. So it makes sense to uh, slightly more custom make the graphs. I usually use a template nowadays. This is a patient again with a uh, vaginus who had a VOK. We had glued twice, still had an area of perforation. Actually, this is a leash of conjunctival vessels and you can easily lift it. The uh, cornea underneath is very thin. So in this patient, we did a, a patch graft using a corneoscleral graft. We made a, a cut a shape of this drape and the same thing was transplanted to the patient and sutures were put. This is a lamella procedure was just done. And uh, the graft integrated pretty well. And when she came for cataract surgery after three years, this was uh, the way the cornea was looking. So I would like to conclude saying that it's very important to identify peripheral ulcerative keratitis early in the disease. And uh, early in the disease identification can save the eye as well as the life of the patient. And you should not shy away from immunosuppression. Um, uh, we have to involve rheumatologists or internal medicine people to do it as soon as possible and as early as possible. And surgical repair should be con attempted only after adequate control of the disease process. Or else what can happen is we can uh, graft a cornea and that graft can also melt away because of the uh, high cytokine load in the system of the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anil. I think uh, those were uh, excellent set of cases and you covered the entire management. The UK cases are really tough to manage and they are best referred to tertiary care centers, uh, especially if they fall in moderate or severe category and uh, they do require the help of immunologists. Uh, several of the cases which you showed in the end, I think highlighted that uh, and they are really tough to manage and actually uh, they are like time bombs, you know, they can just, uh, they can just erupt or they can just go off any moment, despite the fact you may think that you've controlled them, but uh, they just need a trigger, you know, to show the recurrence of PUK. I just want to ask you one thing in your subset of cases of PUK, like when we try to analyze our cases, infection sin still seem to be the commonest cause of PUK and it was most because of herpes. So... Do you also feel the same? Of course, uh, immunological causes have to be, you know, dealt with and they have to be treated and proper investigations have to be done. Uh, okay. Uh, 
uh, I don't know, man. Maybe there's there's a bias in the Persian population that is coming here. So mm. I think uh, we uh, tend to see slightly less of infections in the corneal periphery. I think whichever patients have uh, suspected a secondary microbial keratitis and scraped, uh, most of them have turned negative. I can't remember only one case which had a positive result, and uh, that patient also improved with uh, just regular uh, antibiotics. And you do have a it's your institute and immunologist who also co-manages yeah. these patients. Yeah, yeah, definitely, rheumatologists. I think that is really a must for such cases. Any other question? Otherwise. Uh... Uh, one question. Yeah. See, I mean, uh, now it is very well known that you know we for these cases we have patients should have systemic immunosuppressive. Now that the question is, when will you think of stopping systemic immunosuppression in these patients? Uh, for example, you know you mentioned one case of Morans which has been under control for three years on methotrexate. So will you ever think about uh, stopping systemic yeah. immunosuppression? Yeah, I think uh, they reduce it after. See, first three to six months they give. I think they try to reduce it to 0.5 milligram. For example, methotrexate I'm seeing. Uh, there are people who just maintain on five milligram once a week. And I think two years minimum they keep. So uh, unless you have some systemic inflammatory markers, you know, we, we cannot really say. For example, in that patient, all markers were normal. Uh, so I think they also do the trial and error. They also don't know the answer. I think... Uh, uh, as cornea surgeons, we have a lot of unanswered questions. The amount of un unanswered questions in rheumatology is much more. Much more. Eh? Ocular immunology is a branch which is, you know, which really needs, especially in our country, we don't have too many centers which are dealing with it. Gopal, you have a question. No, it's not a question, ma'am. Uh, one thing is regarding cyclosporin topical, uh, which, uh, which may be, I mean, like in the ocular surface, like in Murans and all, uh, probably with those type of medicines, can you taper off the immunosuppression? Whereas I, I know so. that in the in the uh, more complex uh, cases involving the optic nerve, the sclera, maybe like Wegener's granulomatosis, you won't be able to stop the immunosuppression at all. I think we did publish a study with tropical cycles for in Murans, which 1%. That was 1% made in our ocular pharmacy, which did show that uh, the results are good in Morans. But personally, if you, I think, if you ask me, I don't think Morans really, you know, topical cyclosporin really works for Morans. The, the sample size was small than that. The, uh, the follow-up was also less. But topical cyclosporin probably, you know, you can give it, but I don't think it really works for Morans as well. Others can also, Vinay and Anil, Shweta can maybe talk about it also. Yeah. Uh, Gopal, I think uh, Murin's, uh, the cyclosporin is a very written medicine. You know, the one that is available, 2% cyclosporin, if you prescribe for some people with uh, endothelitis or interstitial keratitis, they will not be able to tolerate it most of the time. That is one main problem that I have seen. But... Uh, being an autoimmune disease, I don't know how far it works, really. Mm -hmm. I don't know. For interest of time, let us move forward. Yeah, next one. I think Shweta has to give one. Anil, can you introduce? Yeah. Uh, Shweta is a senior consultant who has worked with, uh, who was an integral part of the ocular surface team there. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Keita, uh, Dr. Shweta, and uh, Dr. Even Vinay was work, has worked with them in the initial uh, stage uh, along with them. And they actually uh, came up with this great ocular surface team, which is Sankaranthral is famous for. And she's, uh, she's been... Uh, multiple uh, publications she has made and uh, had a, she has been labeled as the best research scientist title was given by the Shankar uh, on research on uh, refractory uh, corneal infections like pithium keratitis, which she mentioned about. She has multiple publications, more than 50 in uh, multiple uh, big journals like cornea and clinical and experiment of thermology. Uh, yeah, we welcome Shweta. Uh, please take it away. 
Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thanks, Dr. Namrata Sharma and the entire team at the Cochin of Thalmulik Society for this uh, opportunity. I'll just share my slides. So you have the toughest topic. When none of us can deal with it, then you can deal with it. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I tweeted the topic a little bit. So, I, you know, I just added the word hope at the end. So when all else fails um, in end stage oculus surface disorders, let us see if we can find some hope. So all photographs are with permission of patients and no financial disclosures. Let me take you through a few cases first. So we had this 38 year old gentleman, a one eyed school teacher who had undergone uh, two penetrating keratoplasties elsewhere and presented to us with a failed graph with 360 degrees limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, we took him up for a penetrating third penetrating keratoplasty and uh, along with a keratolimbal allograft under immunosuppressive cover. Post which his vision improved uh, to 20 by 40 and he maintained this for almost two years. Two years later, he developed a persistent epithelial defect with an early rejection of the keratolimbal allograft. All this resolved with treatment, but it left behind a failed graph and the question, what next? Similarly, another patient, a 45-year-old lady who presented, to, uh, who presented with an anterior staphyloma and a secondary glaucoma. She had undergone a penetrating keratoplasty six years back and complained of diminished vision for the last two years. We took her up for a tectonic lamellar keratoplasty first with a diode cyclophotocoagulation. And once the pressures were under control, we planned and took her up for a penetrating keratoplasty with a keratolimbal allograft, again with oral immunosuppressors. Her vision improved to 20 by 100, and she maintained this for almost three years. She started developing recurrent epithelial defects and was taken care of by an amniotic membrane transplant along with tarsorafi. However, the defect healed but left behind a haze. But the pros lens or the Boston scleral lens came to our rescue and it helped maintain her vision for almost a year. But the epithelium kept breaking down and finally we had a failed graft and the question, what next? Similarly, when you have a patient with Steven Johnson syndrome or an oculus, oculus psychiatrical pemphigoid with a dry keratinized surface or someone following burns with exposure and no lids, the options available are really limited. It is in such cases that keratoprocesses comes forth as the last resort. So if you have a patient who is bilaterally visually handicapped, is having realistic expectations, and is available for regular follow-ups, keratoprocesses can be considered for visual rehabilitation. Well, before we do that, let's go through the checklist. Make sure that the patient is not amblyopic, the glaucoma is under control, the posterior segment status has been noted, and the patient is available and understands the need for a lifelong follow-up and also the cosmetic limitations associated with the surgery. While keratoprocesses processes can be likened to an intraocular lens where you have an optic and a haptic. So based on the type of the haptic, the uh, lens, the keratoprocesses processes is divided into three types, the biocompatible, which are made of PMMA, the bio-integrated, which has the Dacron mesh and can be integrated and gets integrated into the ocular surface. However, this is no longer available. And the biological, where we use a human tooth or a tibial bone. Also, based upon the indications in the eye, they are classified into type 1 and type 2. The type 1 are the Boston type, is that Boston type 1 keratoprocesses, processes, along with its variants, that is the Oro and the Lucia. And the type two, which is the modified osteoendocrat processes, the tibial keratoprocesses, processes, and the Boston type two with its variants. Now let us see the designs. Well, the Boston type one keratoprocess processes is something like a mushroom or a collar pattern shape, where you have a front plate along with the stem, a back plate with the 16 holes, a titanium locking ring, or the back plate has a slit and it snaps into position. The Lucia is a low cost version of this Boston type one keratoprocesses processes and is available in a single action lens. We also have an indigenously manufactured uh, Oro Capro designed by our very Oro Lab India. And it is similar to design of the type, it is similar in design to the type one. Here, both the haptic and the optic are of PMM. When we look at the type two, 
The Boston type 2 is exactly similar to type 1. It just has an anterior nub of 2 millimeters, which is protruded to uh, accommodate the lids. The OOKP has the haptic, which is the canine tooth, which carries the optical cylinder. And the osteocapro is uh, the haptic here is made of the tibial bone and it carries the optical cylinder that is the PMN. Now the basic indications for the type 1 capro, you need the eye to be moist. The patient should have a good blink. There should be no exposure and preferably no underlying immunological condition. However, if you have patients with SJS or ocular psychiatrical pemphigoid or patients with severe chemical injuries, we can think about the OOKP. But if you have a patient who is edentulous, has poor oral hygiene, or they have restricted mouth opening or systemic ailments where multiple GAs are not possible, the Boston type two keratoprocesses, which is a single state surgery, comes to a rescue, or you can consider the osteocapro where the tibial bone is used. The preoperative evaluation for all keratoprocesses surgery requires a detailed history to rule out amblyopia and the exact underlying etiology a visual acuity check, a detailed slit lamp examination, intraocular pressure by finger tension, ultrasound B-scan to rule out uh, the, uh, to take care of the posterior segment status, action length, which also helps us order the final keratoprocesses, processes, and syringing to uh, check for patency of the nasolacrimal duct. Counseling forms an extremely important aspect of your preoperative evaluation, again, reinforcing the need for a follow-up and a cosmetic outcome. In addition to this general preoperative evaluation, with each KPRO, the preoperative uh, look uh, evaluation will change a bit. So in patients with OKP, you will also look for the oral and the dental assessment and will require a dental or the anesthetist evaluation preoperatively. Now, this is how uh, the surgical, uh, the trolley looks like for a type 1 KPRO, where you have the type 1 KPRO with the sticker, the trephine, the donal corneal graft, Prior to uh, the surgery, uh, before entering the eye, the capro is assembled. So an 8.5 millimeters cornea is trephined with a central three millimeters trephination. The optic is placed on the sticker, followed by the corneal graft, and then the back plate and the locking ring. So basically your corneal graft is sandwiched between the back plate and the front plate. The eye is then opened and the capro is sutured to the eye, just like a penetrating graft, a keratoplastic graft, and a bandage contact lens is placed. The type two surgery is again, absolutely similar to type one, but a few additions are, the entire conjunctival mucosa in the recipient eye is removed from lid margin to lid margin, and a simultaneous parse plana vitrectomy along with emic glaucoma valve is done. The OKP is performed in three stages over a period of four to six months following the Rome Vienna protocol. The only modification done at our institute is the type one, uh, is the stage 1A where the eye is prepared and a look at the posterior segment is done to visually prognosticate the patient. In 1B, the oral mucosa is harvested from the cheek and anchored to the eye. 1C involves harvesting the dental, the uh, canine tooth, fashioning it into a lamina and drilling a hole and placing the optic. And this is then placed in the subcutaneous pouch for the fibrovascular cover. In stage two, the capro is then anchored in the eye and the mucosa is reflected back. The osteokeratoprocessor surgery is similar to the MOKP. Here, the only difference being the bone is harvested from the tibia instead of the canine tooth. Now, post-operative care is a little more stringent as far as the type 1 is concerned as compared to the type 2. Here, the bandage contact lens needs to be changed once every three months, and the patients have to be on topical antibiotics and steroid forever. You have to maintain a strict hygiene. The type 2, both the Boston type 2 and the OKP, the patients are maintained only on a topical antibiotic ointment at night, and the follow-up can be once in three months for the type 2 uh, Boston keratoprocesses and for OKP once in six months. At each visit, the best corrected visual acuity is checked for the intraocular pressure by finger tension, the stability of the cylinder, the posterior segment, evaluate the disc and the macula. Visual fields are done once in three months. For the OKP and the osteocarotid processes, a spiral CT scan of the lamina once a year. And in type one keratoprocesses, the bandage contact lens is changed once in three months. 
Now, like any other surgery, we also have complications with keratoprocessor surgery, probably a little more. The complications can be classified into capro-related and the ocular. The most common is the retroprosthetic membrane, which is very similar to what we see post-cataract surgery is the PCO or the posterior capsular opacification. The others are perioptic melt or lamina exposure. The most dreaded ocular complication is endophthalmitis. The incidence is found to be the lowest in modified osteoidentifier processes. However, it would not be fair to compare the type 1 with the type 2 capros. The other being retinal detachment and secondary glaucoma. Now that we have a brief idea as to how uh, the keratoprocessor surgery is done and what are the different types, let me take you through a few case scenarios. Well, this was our first patient, uh, a silicon oil-induced keratopathy for which a type 1, uh, Boston type 1 keratoprocessor was done way back in 2008. And Tajpur Shisha still maintains a vision of 20 by 60. Remember the first patient whom we did uh, three penetrating keratoplasties follow, along with a keratolimbal allograph? He's undergone a Lucia type 1 and now six years maintains a vision of 20 by 50. Another patient post chemical injury uh, after a type 2 keratoprocessus, now eight years, maintains a vision of 20 by 100. This was a nine, this is, sorry, is a 19 year old young girl, a singer by profession, an acid attack survivor, uh, was taken up for uh, MOKP. However, on opening had an anterior stomyeloma, so we undertook, uh, underwent a tectonic lamellar keratoplasty first, followed by a stage 1A MOKP. Following the stage 1A, she developed a retinal detachment, so underwent surgery for the same, and then the stage 1B and C. She also developed mucosal necrosis after the stage 1B. However, that was fine after the mucosal revision, and she was taken up for a stage 2 OKP in 2014 and improved vision improved to 20 by 100, now seven years of follow-up. This is how she was six months down the line in the OPD, singing back to her normal life, working as a receptionist in one of the offices. And three years down the line, she's happily married, a mother of one and a half year old. So as Christopher Ryu said, once you choose hope, everything is possible. So to summarize, these are challenging surgeries. We do have multiple options. So we need to choose the right capro for the right patient. There are possibility of complications. However, timely management can help improve outcomes. And all this is not possible without a team approach. Would like to acknowledge all our patients, our teachers, and the entire team back home without whom all this is not possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shweta. I think uh, that was a, uh, you know, uh, that was a fantastic presentation for cases uh, whom you really can't do anything and keep prescribing lubricants or keep referring from here to there. So there is some hope for these patients and if we don't do it, then who's going to do it? It's like that. So any questions, Vinay, would you like to question Shweta on any aspect? He's been uh, my teacher, no, no, no. so I really doubt whether he should question <laughs> no, no. me. I've been mentored by Dr. Vinay, so... <laughs> That's why I picked him up, because... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nothing, nothing I must to ask from my side other than, you know, appreciate phenomenal work and I hope, you know, this kind of work should continue. Okay, uh, only very few places in India or anywhere in the world, this kind of work is being done. And, you know, you guys top the list. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. It's a real presentation from the heart. Yeah. One, one presentation which is stood out. Really coming from the heart. Congratulations, Shobha, Shweta, and the entire team. Vinay has been talking about you all the time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much. Dr. Very good. Very good. Anil? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Vinay, can you introduce uh, Dr. Titiel, please? Yes, absolutely sure. And it's a great pleasure. And again, as I said uh, before, Titiel, sir, doesn't need much of introduction. Uh, in India or anywhere in the world, I believe. Uh, at, at present, he's a professor and uh, heads the cornea and, and cataract surgery at the uh, RP Center, Delhi. More than 400 publications and 52 book chapters. I mean, lots of oration, keynote, I, just, I don't know what all things I, I should read from this. 
uh, you know, a CV, which short CV, which he has sent. So absolutely, you know, excited and great to have you with us. Uh, please uh, start your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Binay, uh, for an introduction. I, I would uh, definitely like to uh, congratulate the entire team of coaching uh, of the big club, especially, uh, especially Kupal for organizing such a wonderful world webinar. And my dear colleague, uh, Professor Namata Sharma, for inviting me in this uh, a beautiful session on cornea and putting a refractive surgery session to us uh, to okay. conclude the entire corneal <laughs> session here. Let me share my uh, screen. Uh, I would be a, a brief so that we can have some uh, discussion on uh, important issues. We all know refractive surgery per se uh, is one surgery which is not limited to our cornea surgeons. It is done by uh, general ophthalmologists also. You may be trained in the retina, you may be trained in ocular plastic, but you are free to do a refractive surgery. As we know, this is the surgery which has the outcome. I think one of the most predictable outcome we can have in a human body in, or for any surgery which is being done is refractive surgery. I'll be talking on a corneal uh, refractive procedure uh, with lasers. No relevant uh, financial disclosure for me. It will have uh, three components, uh, friends. Uh, I'll be talking on uh, patient selection criteria, which is based on uh, the present day uh, contest. What are important uh, indices which makes us to support the feasibility of doing a laser refractive procedure for a one uh, particular young patient? Then a choice of surgery, you have a gamut of surgery available for us. You have to choose them as per the uh, morphological parameter or as per the choice of patient or as per the suitability of profession of a particular person. The third important thing is, important thing is looking for a post-operative outcome, especially looking for a biomechanical uh, outcomes because that is what going to decide on is there any sort of uh, complication going to happen in a particular case which has undergone a refractive procedure? What are the outcomes for a customized procedure uh, in today's contest? What about uh, looking into quality of life after these refractive procedures? So these are three areas which I would cover in a briefly. The first thing I would talk about is uh, looking onto the various aspects of screening or refractive surgery. I'll not go into the basic of uh, workup for these patients. We all do it in an appropriate manner. So we are looking for three important areas. The first was uh, topographical indices. You all understand uh, in our time when we started doing refractive, uh, laser refractive procedures, we didn't have these things. We had just cornea, refractive error, and we used to do surgery. Even our corneal thickness was a, not a very significant parameter in those days. But thankfully, people have understood, come out with the various uh, parameters to judge the suitability of a particular cornea, to undergo a laser refractive procedure. So we had topographical indices. Now we have tomographical indices, especially BAD, which is such an important parameter now. And for, for last few years, we have com combination of uh, biomechanical and topographical uh, parameters to give us uh, some more uh, thinking on to uh, removing the patient from the uh, sur surgical list of refractive surgery by excluding the most important aspect is a subclinical ectasia to pick up in these patients because they're young patients, they are myopic patients most of the time. And this is one aspect which people have understood, have to understand. We have to rule out uh, patients who doesn't have clinical feature, who doesn't have topographical feature, but they still may be a subclinical ectasia patients. So there what uh, our focus should be for these patients. So this is what uh, we have looked into uh, in looking at topo uh, topographical parameter ways. We all looked into four areas. First was looking at sagittal map. We all know keratometry more than 48 diopters. What a difference between two eyes more than two diopters. K max and K2 are more than one diopters. What a skewing for more than 21 degrees. Inferior superior more than four diopters. This is a classically finding based on a, a, the sagittal map, which we have been knowing for a, almost a now two decades. Anterior elevation more than 12 microns, posterior elevation more than 17 microns. Or a pachymetry, which is such an important uh, aspect now, especially looking for a pachymetry if it is less than 470 with normal topography. Uh, people should not be looking for a refractive procedure in those cases. Or 
colon thickness, even maybe 500, but abnormal topography are a risk at risk corneas, apart from the other pachymetry indices. So you're looking into all these parameters, most patients you can screen out as such, but you have to look onto the uh, tomographic parameter. And one of the best tool we have nowadays is a pentacam, which can give you all the parameters and most importantly, looking for a three important things apart from the, all the parameter, which is highlighted here. We are looking for ART max, which if it is less than 412 is a suspect uh, case. And second important thing is a PPI average. If that is uh, normal, it will be around 1.2. Anything more than that uh, will be a, a suspect uh, case. And third important thing is the bad uh, for that cases. You all know uh, a D value of uh, 1.6 or more is suspicious for a uh, character corners. Or if you take 2.1 as a cutoff, then it is 100% diagnosed of keratoconus. So bad is a good uh, parameter to diagnose keratoconus. Or if you have a patient who, who has a keratoconus, this particular criteria or a parameter indices will tell you that the patient has keratoconus. Let me uh, look into other important area because for last few years, we are looking for a biomechanical uh, parameters to uh, enhance our diagnosis of sub subclinical keratoconus in patient coming for corneal refractive procedures. So there we're looking for a CBI or TBI, that is a Corvus Biomechanical Index or a Tomographic Biomechanical Indexes. That is uh, important because we understand the biomechanical changes may occur before the actual morphological change which you see in a keratoconus. And to detect former first day or a subclinical cases, you may have to combine the tomographic and biomechanical parameters to basically differentiate between normal cornea from the subclinical cases. So it is the combination of indices which is important for us to look into this important aspect for clearing patient for refractive procedure. Just to describe the, the Corbis Biomechanical Index, which is described by Binsegura uh, uh, et al. It is basically the corneal deformation response or a response parameter which comes with the appellation uh, uh, in relation to the corneal uh, horizontal thickness profile, which gives you, an uh, uh, analyzed by a logistic regression analysis, will give you this parameter. So it is a good parameter if you look into a, a cutoff value. If I take a cutoff value of 0 0.05, it is 100% sensitive, almost 98.4% uh, specific to diagnose uh, ectasia. So this particular uh, CBI is a good indices to diagnose the ectasia in your case. But looking to a TBI, there's a tomography biomechanical indices, which also looks into a aspect of a diagnosing case ectasia. If I look into a, a cutoff or 0.79 in TBI, so this is going to give you a very nice uh, specificity for a diagnosis ectasia in your case. But if you look into a subclinical case of a keratoconus, you have to take 0.29 as a cutoff. It will be quite sensitive and specific to diagnose subclinical. It is here to understand that if I combine bad and tomographic indices, it can give you a diagnosis of subclinical keratoconus. While only biomechanical indices, as we talked about earlier, may not be giving you the subclinical diagnosis, but it is good for a diagnosing ectasia. The combination is better to diagnose these cases. So there, there will be a, uh, so many ectasia screening programs, but if you combine uh, biomedical uh, indices, it will give you a much better parameter. But if you combine the tomographic indices with now a new parameter, that is a stiffness parameter, uh, application one, will be more sensitive to give you a subclinical ectasia. So I'm taking you from, from the simple topographic to tomographic tomographic to a combination of a biomechanical. From biomechanical, there are two, three indices which enhances your diagnosis of a former first day or subclinical keratoconus. These are various uh, studies based on a, a TBI, which ranges from a 0.16 to 0.9. The various studies, and because they may be a difference in a various ethnicity, but they normally range from 0.16 to 0.9. But the new indices which has come, that is SPA1, a stiffness parameter, which is around 96 to 106. So these are very recent, recently uh, uh, put forward the indices, which is going to enhance our diagnosis of subclinical keratoconus. So let me take you through a few examples of uh, tomographic indices. If you see this uh, uh, 
tomography here, right eye looks quite normal. If we avoid uh, or if we don't have left eye parameter, you might take this patient for suitable for a uh, refractive procedure. Because if you look into a parameter, bad D is normal. So if you have only bad D and this uh, tomography picture, this patient seems to be suitable for refractive procedure. We would, would have missed other things. But see here, if you look into a CBI, that is a, a Corvus Biomechanical uh, Indices, which is 0.94, which is uh, abnormal. And TBI is also abnormal. So this shows that it's not only the bad or a tomographic uh, four quad map. You have to look into other indices to really look into a subclinical case. This is a case number two, where you see that this patient has an inferior steepening here, which is uh, inferior temporal, uh, inferior nasal steepening is uh, in this particular case. But uh, looking at this area, see the uh, posterior elevation uh, is also not matching the steepness anterior area. So these patients would require a further investigation by looking at a biomedical, uh, this thing. Bad is definitely going to be abnormal once you have a steepening, uh, which is around 48 here. And other parameters are also abnormal here. Let, let's go through the biomechanical indices here. See here, bad is abnormal, 0.24. And you can see uh, bad will also correspond to the TBI, which is also abnormal here. But uh, biomechanical CBI is uh, normal. So this particular case shows that to diagnose uh, ectasia, it is bad and TBI, which is more sensitive than a CBI here. The such cases uh, will be diagnosed as a form of first day. We need to wait for uh, another six months to one year to look for a change in the parameter. If they are stable, no further change. Maybe you can think of a procedure in this particular case. Let's see other patient, which looks a normal uh, four quad map for a patient, case number three. Both, uh, all the para four parameters are normal. Corneal thickness around 500 here. So this patient would be a suitable for a refractive procedure. Bad is normal. But if you just look into other parameters, bad being normal, but CBI is abnormal and TBI is borderline. So what to do in such patients? You might be considering this patient for refractive procedure, but I would say let's uh, see the another parameter which we talked about, the stiffness parameter for this patient. Fellow eye is also similar parameter as you have. But looking into a stress uh, stain index in this patient, that has a decrease in this patient because this particular line has shifted towards the left. That indicates decrease in a SSI value for this patient, which is totally uh, not uh, dependent on a colonic thickness. So this gives you a better parameter to enhance or to combine with the TBI, CBI to give you a better uh, result. If you see here, CBI is abnormal here. But uh, if you look at SPA1 also, which is lower in this patient also, apart from SSI, which is shifted to the left-hand side. So this patient, given an option, I will not do a refractive procedure at this stage. Evaluate this patient for next six months or one year. Most of these patients are young. And then decide what procedure to be done in this patient. Other important parameter, apart from looking at the tomography picture, nowadays we also focus on our epithelial mapping also. And that can also enhance the diagnosis of ectasia in your patients, or especially for a patient who are going to going undergoing a trans epithelial PRK. So this epithelial mapping mapping may be very important uh, tool for us. But classically, if you have an epithelial donut pattern that uh, suggests uh, uh, ectasia in your patient, and second important parameter which I would consider is uh, inferior or inferior temporal epithelial thinning which will also suggest uh, keratoconus or ectasia in this patient. Just see this patient here. We have uh, inferior temporal uh, steepening here. And uh, if you look at the corneal thickness, which is absolutely normal, 535 is the corneal thickness. Posterior elevation is uh, slightly more, but looks quite okay as such. But just see the epithelial thick, uh, mapping here. The thinning of epithelium is corresponds to the, the active, the, the steepening we had in a uh, tomographic map. So this is a good uh, map to give you a strengthening of a diagnosis of ectasia for your patients. This is another patient which has, again, you can see a steepening is inferior nasal. So this tells you there's a little bit of uh, uh, eccentricity also in terms of uh, steepening in cancer. But if you do epithelial mapping for this patient, this other eye, which also looks similar, so just see epithelial mapping here and bad is normal in this patient. Both are bad are normal. So this patient looks quite okay. But just to see here, 
you had a absolutely a normal parameter but see uh, the thickening of uh, epithelium here rather than having thinning you have a thickening in the inferior area so this is a pseudo elevation which has been picked up by epithelial mapping so this patient is suitable for effective procedure so you should not only go with the area of steepening which you saw earlier you saw the steepening here if you look into epithelial mapping there should have been a thinning in that area but here it is a thickening in, instead of a thinning so that suggests <coughs> It's just an epithelial uh, thickening here. This patient is suitable for a refractive surgery because BAD is also normal and other parameters also normal. So this will differentiate pseudo, uh, uh, you can say elevation from the normal elevation map you see in these patients. So this is a patient who had planned for a trans epithelial uh, PRK. This is a normal uh, tomographic map in this patient. And uh, you can see CBI is uh, little on a borderline, other parameters BAD and TBI is normal. But see here, if you have not done epithelial mapping, just feed it 50 for uh, your trans-epithelial PRK. The, uh, you can see epithelial is very thin here. It's ranging from 46, 49 to 50. So that would have given uh, definitely different outcomes. So this has a very significant, uh, important uh, mapping to be done for all patients undergoing um, trans-epithelial PRK as such. Based on all those investigative modalities, uh, which are very, very important, and it's a necessity tool uh, for investigating all cornea-based procedure. In fact, for a, even for a lens-based procedure also, cornea has to be stable. So how do we decide what procedure to be done for these patients? So I would say if you have a normal D value and CVI T is normal, so this is a, a suitable patient for refractive procedure if other parameters are not contraindicated. So directly, we can go for any uh, refractive procedure for this patient. Laser-based procedure will be better if you have a refractive error in the, that particular range. If one or two indices are abnormal, so this patient needs to be observed for the next six months to one year, depending on the age and sex of the patient. Then consider subsequently if parameters are stable. So we look for a PRK, a smile, or an extra procedure to give a much more strengthening of a biomechanical uh, corneal strength wise. But important consideration comes up when you have an abnormal D value, you have an abnormal CBI, TBI in such cases. So these cases either can be subclinical keratoconus, which is the case we are going to come to us. If they have frank keratoconus, we have discussed the treatment uh, earlier. If they are subclinical keratoconus, they might progress to keratoconus, they will remain like that. So it will depend if there are stable uh, cornea for the next six months to one year, the same parameter, you can consider a uh, uh, extra procedure for these patients. What about uh, wavefront uh, or a customized ablation for your patient? Which are those cases where you like to uh, go for a wavefront or customized ablation? The patient has a satisfactory visual -like quality. Patient is happy with their quality of vision with glasses or contact lenses. Higher order ablations are in normal range. We can do a wavefront optimized or topographic ablation can be done for these patients. They'll have a very good uh, visual outcome. But if they have a preoperative HOA, which is on the higher side, they have a glare and halos with their refractive corrections. We need to do a wavefront analysis of this patient. If HOA is more than 0 0.04, and if they have predominantly corneal higher order ablations, so these are good cases for a topo guided uh, ablation if you get a good topo maps for these patients. But if they have a corneal as well as internal higher order ablations, and you can achieve a good ocular uh, wavefront maps, then we should do a wavefront guided ablation for this patient. So this is a chart which gives you a basic way of approaching a patient, what type of uh, customized approach should be given to that particular case. Little bit on a uh, little bit on topo guided ablation, contura as such, we all know uh, it might give you a better outcome because it will give you a ablation it gives a corneal curvature as uh, ideal as possible as compared to a planar wavefront uh, uh, optimized ablation in your patients. And whatever uh, uh, corneal ablation or measuring, that is a, not dependent on pupil because it is it gives you a peripheral ablations also. It's not like a, a internal wavefront assessment, which is dependent on pupil. So you're going to have a larger area of consideration and the pupil uh, central shift will not make any difference for this patient. So, and it will be a useful tool if you have a good quality of repeatable topographic maps from your topolizer or oculizer, and it is a requisite for to transport this data to your analysis. And subsequently, you can do a, a 
to provide a treatment for your patients. The other important criteria which we consider and which has been considered in FDA study was if your magnitude and axis of cylinder is not much, they are within the range of uh, correction. If your deviation is not more than 20 degrees, that is suitable for a topogadial ablation axis. So this is what uh, Rigel published uh, with the TK, TCAT study group. They found that uh, almost 93% of cases had uncorrected visual acuity 2020 or better at one year. And 65% had a 2016, around 35, uh, 20 by 12.5 or better. And almost 30% had one, one or nine more improvement of vision, which is a remarkable outcome uh, of a refractive procedure for their patients. And they also seen their patient as time progresses at 12 months from 7% to 16% had improved uh, uh, vision, that is 20 by 10, which is significant shift, more than 50, more than 100% shift of patients, 7 to 16% uh, is a large number. So this shows that topogadial ablation will, if you observe these patients for a longer period, they have a definitely improved outcome compared to away from LASIK for these patients. So this is definitely has an advantage because this will decrease the uh, HOAs, better contrast sensitivity, which they talk about, and lower induction of higher order ablation. So it is decrease, uh, it is decrease the total higher order ablation and induction also less. Therefore, the quality of vision also improves for these patients. This, this is what uh, we talk about now. There, there are many patients where uh, refractive cylinder and a manifest cylinder and topo uh, cylinder doesn't match uh, within of 20 degrees and they have a larger shift. I think this AI-based uh, uh, algorithm that is uh, going to be uh, much more accurate. Uh, four studies uh, is people are working on this. There's a few studies which has come, which looks into not only the corneal wavefront, it also takes into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism as well as the lenticular astigmatism also. Therefore, the outcomes will be better with this uh, new software. And they have found that uh, the results are almost similar, but this has uh, at least large number of patients getting into 2016 or better, uh, which is significantly better than our initial FDA study as such. And more patients could be included who had a larger degree of cylinder and difference between the topo and uh, manifest cylinder also. There are some more studies to comprehend the uh, outcomes of four cities which have found that the results are better with the, if you apply 4CD software in a topogadial ablation as such. Little bit on a post-LBC uh, uh, corneal biomechanics. We all know once you do a laser ablation or a flap, that will decrease the corneal strength. That will be appreciated by a uh, biomechanical weakening of cornea. And if you look at the procedure-wise, PR case will be the best because it will have a most uh, significantly larger number of corneal tissue without causing damage to the, the most uh, uh, area of uh, anterior compact uh, lamellis, which is uh, second will be smile and the, the least will be with the LASIK procedures. So in that way, I think uh, PRK has much more value in maintaining the stent. But if you combine with the cross-linking, then results will be better than a non-cross-linking because biomechanical stent wise, we know that cross-linking cornea will be better. Because most of the time it's a healing process which makes a difference in outcome. But biomechanical strength wise, uh, I think lesser is the damage to the con anterior corneal stoma, better will be the strength for these patients. So these are studies which compares the uh, SMILE versus LASIK. We all definitely SMILE should perform better in terms of bi biomechanical strength wise. If you look into Aura as a uh, tool here, both seem to be almost equal in terms of biomechanical stand. But if you look at Corbis, uh, have found that uh, SMILE is uh, comparable to a femtosecond LASIK in terms of uh, preserving or a post-op biomechanical stand wise. But if you compare the microcaratum LASIK, uh, SMILE performs better. Similarly, if you compare SMILE with a surface ablation, then uh, they're almost equal in terms of biomechanical outcome wise. And uh, if you look into Corbis, also, the out outcomes are almost similar. LASIK versus surface. Surface does better than a LASIK here. But if you look into a, a diagnosis of ectasia, which is, I think, major concern for all of us, it's very difficult to pick up ectasia with a, a standard tool like Pentacam or a Corvus now. Now we have a new uh, software which can pick up the uh, ectasia post-laser vision corrected uh, corneas. 
So basically, it's going to differentiate uh, post laser cornea from the ectasia by predicting the outcome wise in these cases. So these are parameters based on which uh, LVC software works out. If you take a cutoff or point 0 0.2, then uh, it's a very sensitive tool. This is one example of one of my patients. If you look into just on a, a CBI here, which is 0.99, which is on the higher side, and uh, SPA2 also decrease in this patient. But as soon as you click the uh, uh, LVC software in this patient, you can see the uh, CBI is almost normal, which is zero here. So this patient is not ectasia post laser correction. This is basically a, a normal like post laser patient. This is another patient of ours where if you see a CBI and TBI bad uh, is normal, but uh, if you see CBI, you can see 0.99, which is a higher sign. But even looking to a, a post uh, CBI LBC here, your CBI remains higher. So this is actually the ectasia patient of these patients. So this software has come as a good handy tool for us in a post laser vision corrected cornea, so where we can really pick differentiate between normal uh, post laser vision cornea from the ectasia patients here. Outcome wise, this is a meta analysis, uh, network meta analysis uh, of all uh, refractive cases reported here. The visual outcome, if you look into efficacy, safety, and higher order abrasions, classic smile uh, are almost equal. Uh, there's no significant difference as such. But if uh, femtosecond LASIK seems to be better, if you compare the first 24 hours uh, outcome compared to smile in these patients. Similarly, uh, if you look into uh, the trend or uh, people talk about the, uh, uh, you can say uh, their ranking. So if you look into ranking wise, uh, efficacy wise, femtosecond LASIK uh, ranks number one, though statistically there are no difference. Similarly, predictability wise, you can see if you look into 0.5 as a target, femtosecond LASIK again ranks number one. Safety wise, again LASIK ranks number one. The smile is in between uh, other procedures like uh, epilasic, PRK. So if you, this gives you a trend to us a, a little more predictability for a femtosecond LASIK. But if you look into higher uh, refractive errors, like higher, higher myopia, there is smile uh, overtakes uh, femtosecond LASIK because there's lesser induction of higher order abrasion and better outcomes. Dry eye, which is a major discussion point after all refractive procedures, we definitely have a smile outscoring other procedure here, lesser dry eye incidence with a smile in short term studies. Also, I think better contrast sensitivity, which may go with uh, you know, early you know, sub basal nerve density uh, being there in a smile patient, lesser post inflammatory uh, response. The healing response in all refractive procedures are totally different. If you take from a surface to a smile to a LASIK flab, the response to healing is different. The outcome will also govern by those, especially the inflammatory, dry eye, and the visual outcome in these patients. Quality of vision, again, uh, would say long-term results uh, would be almost similar to all uh, refractive procedures. But if you look into a patient satisfaction, uh, it is better with a LASIK and a smile. LASIK maybe slightly more than smile because only uh, at attention of a patient getting good visual outcome in these patients. Dry eye, definitely less with the smile group. And we all consider smile as a preferred uh, surgical choice, especially with the contact sports or uh, younger patient getting into other uh, professional areas. And quality of life wise, a smile outscores other refractive procedures. I think I have covered the major areas of refractive areas. Uh, to just to summarize, we all know Dr. modern uh, coronal laser based refractive procedures are uh, very, very predictable, safe, hardly have any complications uh, at this stage. And most importantly, the quality of life after these procedures are uh, absolutely better and patient satisfaction is uh, uh, up to the 10 out of 10 in these cases. There's a rapid advancement in terms of uh, uh, excluding patient with subclinical keratoconus, especially combining the uh, tomographic and biomechanical indices. Customized procedures are there, not required for all cases. It is only for those cases where you can get a good uh, uh, abrasion profile from the cornea, that is a topolizer, or patient where you can get a good oculizer or an internal wavefront abrasion. You might think of a customized procedure for those patients. Though there is no ideal consensus for protocol for tobogyne LASIK, but people are working on that. So I can consider uh, 
all defective procedure, a patient is uh, selected properly, would have a better outcome, not only for immediate after surgery, for a very, very long term also. And I have not covered the uh, re-surgeries, other things, which is, that's a very, very long procedure. But re-surgery is also very simple in all types of refractive procedure now. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, nobody could have done justice to the topic as you have done. And uh, although we had only refractive surgery as one talk, one talk, but then, you know, it covered everything. Uh, as far as refractive surgery is concerned and newer insights, you know, which people don't really understand. So if there are any questions, uh, Vinay or Anil. Yeah, it was a brilliant talk, Dr. TTL. I think it was really yeah. worth the wait. Uh, I was actually yeah. feeling quite guilty to keep your talk as uh, the last talk, but it's, we wanted to keep cornea and refractive surgery. <laughs> and uh, you were speaking. This is, the best, this is the best time if you see that way. Uh, <laughs> as far as the viewership is concerned. <laughs> it's a it's all it's all it's it's a really it's veritable it's checklist for any refractive surgeon. They should actually uh, re-watch it and actually treasure it. Any question, Vinay, you would want to ask? I think there was a question which uh, Dr. Sujit was asking that when you do topo-guided LASIK, then which are the maps? What about the centration? Like centration may not be... You know, okay, that okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are two different things. One is, you know, doing a normal cornea. That is uh, Kantura we talk about. And one is a, a totally aberrated cornea. That we do in our keratoconus eyes. Uh, it, the two are totally different. Well, Kantura we have understood now, as we, I talked about uh, getting a good uh, topo map for these patients. And uh, actually getting a, a good analysis of uh, topo refraction and the manifest refraction. And those are easy patients where we have uh, both your topo refraction and manifest refraction are matching. These patients always do better. They would have done better with the wavefront optimized also. Because I am personally, I am not very fond of uh, Contura as such. Because people force you to do it. Because wavefront optimized has given us a, such a wonderful uh, results in uh, normal cornea patients. But yes, the other way around is which we started doing a, a topo uh, guided or TCAT for a keratoconus or a irregular astigmatism patient. There, when we started, I also didn't understand how it is going to work out. Because there also, because it was so difficult to get a good map from these patients, especially keratoconus patients. So we did a struggle uh, centration in these patients. So they were just analyzed and uh, you have to go through all those uh, parameters and try to adjust the uh, internal uh, uh, wavefront parameters in that and ablate the less than 50 microns if possible in the peripheral area. So basically making the uh, peripheral and central area in a, in a, in a way, the peripheral uh, steepening or flattening should be made as smooth as possible. So that was the only consideration. And uh, the study we had done was, uh, we didn't do primary keratoconus. We did, uh, in those cases, we were undergone cross-linking first. We waited for uh, six months after cross-linking. So cornea parameters are sort of stabilized. Then we assessed their uh, uh, corneal uh, topographic uh, wavefront. Then we treated that those patients. Because now I understand if you look into canal plus group, they do a combined procedure. They take the primary keratoconus analyze the wavefront and do a, a cross-linking and topo, first do the topo, then do a cross-linking in these cases. So either way can be done. I think the primary procedure, uh, they have reported to have a better outcomes uh, in these cases. I think so that explains it all and the difference between uh, doing a topo-guided uh, ablation in a normal cornea and in a aberrated cornea. I think that is what we need to understand. They're completely different. So what about contour? A lot of patients, you know, they would come and say that I, they want to get only contour done. And uh, I don't know, commercially it has uh, become, you know, that way, uh, the most soft, sought after uh, LASIK as far as the Google is concerned. So if they come up with contour, then how do you persuade or dissuade them out of no, it? No, we, we definitely welcome these patients who have uh, some knowledge on, uh, you know, topographic or a uh, customized ablation. 
we like to investigate them and do their analysis and then tell them uh, if that is required or not required. If that procedure is going to improve their outcome compared to the normal wavefront optimized treatment. Most patients who come to us uh, don't fall into within 20 degree of uh, deviation of axis of astigmatism. We have seen uh, it is almost more than that. Almost all uh, people have more than 40 or 50 degree deviation because these patients <clears throat> go around and come back to you to us and to get analysis done. So we normally tell them that your deviation, your manifest refraction and topo refraction doesn't match that well and your outcomes can be sometimes difficult to predict. In such cases, better do a simple wavefront to optimize. Another important consideration is to get a, at least uh, those good five maps, uh, topo maps, which can be you know, uh, of a consideration for a calculation is very difficult in most cases. So that assess rule out, rules out many, many patients for suitability. So that also we discuss with the patient and most patients understand that it's not going to uh, improve their outcome. And uh, we do a routine optimized treatment for this patient. But there are patients who demand we do it. Uh, and uh, the outcome which uh, we are going to analyze them also, is not very different from the wavefront optimized. In fact, some of my patient initial, uh, uh, you can say jumping into a contour where we didn't understand all those things. Some patient in fact lost one or two lines also because the deviation of cylinder the amount and axis are so different and to get a which cylinder to treat it was difficult. Now I'm pretty sure with the forcities coming, things will be better because that takes into other points into consideration because it is very important to know that uh, we are treating the corneal wavefront here apart from treating the uh, refractive error. So if you have, if patient has internal wavefront aberration, then that patient is never going to be happy with the contour vision alone. So there, I think four will make a difference there because that looks into all other aspects. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, any other question? Gopal, are we on time? <laughs> we are for, <laughs> Gopal has to serve a lunch for us now. <laughs> so you have already is... served the lunch, sir. Yeah. <laughs> surgery. It was icing on the cake. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Gopal uh, had told us it's still 12, but he said doesn't matter. The next session is at 2, so you can yeah. go on and on. So we were all liberal <laughs> and, you know. That's a that's a very nicely organized. That's why I said in initially uh, congratulations to the team because yeah. they have given enough time for uh, you know presentation and discussion. Yeah. I was listening to all the discussions. I didn't respond to your questions, <laughs> but I was listening to the entire uh, discussion. It was wonderful, and all the presentation right from uh, you know Sweta to Vishal, uh, mm -hmm. the presentation was wonderful, and it's very difficult to have you know such a comfortable uh, you know, presentation and discussion. Well done. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I know Gopal every week is doing some of the other programs yeah. with Two Dr. More. Sai and uh, yeah, excellent. Two more sessions to go, madam. Today, yeah. retina and oculoplasty. <laughs> Dr. Chitiel was telling we are giving adequate time to cornea, but you know, I'll be <laughs> asked by yeah. the retina, which has only three hours stat. Absolutely three no hours. And, you know, and the plasty and the plasty session talks uh, starts by a talk with Dr. Carol Shield. Oh, wow. I saw that. <laughs> so we can't encroach too much on that also. I know, I know. From another so we, we, we did a little cheating, you know. We, he didn't allow us to extend this side, so we extended, you know, in the early morning side. <laughs> yeah. But we had people from US and they could not be, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. the early morning was very convenient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw you had uh, two corners, you know, US and Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two so, ends. Two Americans who, for them, it was midnight, so yeah. we had to accommodate. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, uh, Thank, you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Anil and Dr. Vinay, yeah. uh, for moderating the thing and being there and 